Good morning. Today is December 11th. We are here for the agenda assessment appeals board number one special hearing. If Brandon would take roll call, please. Yes, board member Lunetta. Present. Board member Wall. Present. And board member Sisk. We're present. Okay. Let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Go ahead and put our attendees under oath this morning if you want to get back up. <laughs> uh, when I complete one of your oath, please state I do. You and each of you do solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give in the matters now pending before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. You may now be seated. Thank you. This is normally the time for public comments, but uh, there are no members of the public present today. Any public here? Any comments from the board? None. No. Okay. I'd like to welcome our new all new member. We have a, we'll be breaking him in today. Okay. Do we want to go with an overview, or should we just start? We kind of know what's going on. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, yeah. So um, we have several cases for the Vons companies. I did want to clarify. Um, Mr. Gangloff, oh, sorry, are you the person that asked me? Uh, sorry, I didn't get your name. Um, Nathan, uh, the exhibits just say 2019. Are we moving with 2019 and 2020 today? Uh, yeah, we're moving with both. Uh, we have the 2020. Sorry, can you turn on your mic? <laughs> First time. Uh, yeah, we have the 2020 information. We can distribute that now if you guys would like. I figured we were opening 19 first, so we'd go through that and submit the 20 at the end, but we could give that to you now if you'd like. And essentially, all the backup information will be for 19 and 20. So um, if we would just want to maybe read in our opinion of value for 2020, all of the information regarding 19 will also be for 2020. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's how uh, the board wants prefer. to proceed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, the reason I'm asking the assessors requested findings effect just, uh, sorry, on one 2019 case and one 2020 case. Um, so I was just trying to figure out if we were splitting the hearing or not before we um, got into the overview. So it sounds like you're okay to do it as one presentation from the applicant side? We are okay. Okay. With that. Yeah. And is that how the assessor's planning to proceed as well? Correct. Um, so, Chair, I, I'd say I've, before we go to the overview, I, I've handed out the applicant's exhibits. I, I'd say maybe we should number them um, just so everyone's on the same page. I'll go through them and okay. list out the exhibit number. Um, and then we can determine if we need to, I guess, so to clarify, do you want to hand out more exhibits now or you want to wait till later? Uh, it's, it's up to you guys. Up to the board? Yeah. Board, do you want to get everything now or? We can wait on them. Okay. Let's, let's try to keep less Whatever stuff up here to sort processes. through. All right. Because it's, it's pretty similar, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it'll basically just be the numbers that we'll be just distributing. Like different we can dates. Do that okay. Now or just whatever your guys' okay. process is. Yeah. Okay. So per the board, we'll wait. We'll wait. Yeah. Let's okay. wait on that. Let's just do nineteen right now. All right. So for two thousand nineteen, exhibit one is going to say a narrative at the bottom. Um, exhibit two will say yes. So uh, just up at the bottom of the cover page, they have a hearing date, and right above that is what the exhibit is described as. So the exhibit one is narrative. Exhibit two is going to say references in the center. Exhibit three is Marshall and Swift cost manual. Exhibit four. Yeah. So exhibit four is the. Or sorry, exhibit three is the Marshall and Swift cost manual. Exhibit four says new store RCN analysis. Exhibit five says SBE and CAA guidelines. Exhibit six says opinion of value. Exhibit seven says 2018 Albertson sale dash West Covina CA. Exhibit eight says 2018 Albertson sale dash West Covina CA. Wait, wait, no. wait, wait, wait. no, we missed. I one. might have two copies. Let's see yep. what's going on here. I just marked that as seven. 
So yeah. so okay, so everyone else click. only has one that says 2018 Albertson sale. There's there's only supposed to be one that's okay. 2018 Albertson sale, West Covina. You might have an extra copy. Right. And is anyone missing their copy? Uh, Rick, you might be. All right. And then oh, next is Bakersfield. Extra? Thank you. So that's yep. actually seven. I have an eight on it. All right, so eight is going to be 2018 Von Sale Bakersfield dash CA. Uh, nine is going to be 2018 Pavilion Sale Sherman Oaks. Ten is going to be Industry Articles. Eleven is going to be Fixed Asset Detail. And twelve is going to be Industry Letters, and that completes the applicant's exhibit submitted so far. Thank you for that. Now we're all organized. So does the applicant just want to start with their presentation or do we want to have a small overview? That's up to you. What it's up the to your board. board. I mean, I can just tell you these are business property appeals yeah. for various Vons companies owned throughout the county for years 2019 and 2020. Um, and so it's just business personal property. As I previously said, the assessors requested written findings of fact. Uh, the applicant has the burden of proof and will present first. Um, so I don't know if you need additional information from the assessor before we proceed or we can get into the applicant's presentation. Council would like the applicant's representatives to slowly state and spell their names so I can reflect them properly on the findings. Uh, Nathan Gangloff, agent for the applicant, G-A-N-G-L-O-F-F. -F. And then Ricky Gangloff, again, at G A N G. L O F F. I missed that, but I'll just have you write your name there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Yep. Um, did you have something to say? Oh, the the accessory does have a brief overview. I'm not sure if that was okay. If you want to, if if you're ready, then yeah, go ahead. Let's. Okay. We'll hear what. Just to highlight the points. Okay. So, uh, good morning, Board and County Council. My name is Steve Bates, a supervising appraiser with the Assessor's Office. And to my left is Brooke Hill. She's our chief appraiser. And to my right, we have Joe Vernon, and he is our uh, senior appraiser uh, for personal property, or senior auditor appraiser, excuse me, uh, for appeals. And so this morning, we uh, the issues raised in the appeal um, are regarding lien dates 2016, 17, and 2018. And uh, just to highlight a couple of the issues this morning. 2019. Oh, 2019 and 2020 lien dates, I apologize. So uh, some of the issues this morning is whether the uh, cost approach uh, per property tax rule six, uh, based on the applicant's actual acquisitions and disposals is most appropriate. Um, another question is, does Vons and their competitors engage in buying used equipment? Also, is the applicant's square, footed, square footage a valid estimate of installation cost? Um, regarding the cost approach, when considering the cost approach to value, the following issues have been raised. What is the correct economic life to be utilized in the cost approach? The assessor has used the 12-year life for retail equipment and fixtures as recommended by the California Assessors Association, according to the lifting studies performed, which analyzed actual mortality data for similar situated properties. Also, the applicant utilized a nine-year life based on Marshall and Swift expectancy guidelines, which is based on IRS publication 534 and 946, and are intended only for depreciation for income tax purposes. Another is the square footage and analysis listed in Marshall and Swift services appropriate to use. Furthermore, is the age, age life method, which the applicant utilized from the American Society of Appraisers fourth edition, an appropriate effective age to be used with Marshall valuation services depreciation tables. Um, the last two here is whether there is an additional adjustment for abnormal obsolescence due to excess operating expenses for refrigeration equipment and shelving, 
which is not accounted for in the assessor's cost approach. This may be known as functional obsolescence from excess operating expenses. And then lastly, whether there are ghost ac assets that are being assessed. And that concludes our overview. Okay, thank you very much. All right, if you guys are ready to present your side. Uh, I'd like to start with the, I'd like to start with the uh, first exhibit, exhibit one, our narrative. Uh, this is also just uh, another overview of our case and what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, so today we're looking at the Vaughn's companies. Uh, it's uh, one of the largest food and drug retailers in North America, operating over 2,200 stores in the United States. Uh, essentially, Vons operates stores, you know, uh, ranging in size from uh, 5,900 square feet to 90,000 square feet. Uh, they have a very efficient build-out process. Uh, they have companies that come in and efficiently build out all of their uh, locations for them. And uh, essentially what we're here today to talk about is the issue that we have with the costs uh, and the assessment by the assessor's office. Uh, we feel that uh, the year life that they're using is too uh, aggressive to the assessor's benefit, and we also believe that there should be a cost adjustment made uh, immediately to the cost of the assets uh, to account for those ghost assets that the assessor mentioned. Both the assessor's office and the apl applicant have valued Vaughn's store equipment, fixtures, and decor using the cost approach to value. However, the applicant believes that the percent good factors used by the assessor's office to value the aforementioned equipment do not provide an accurate estimate of fair market value. So uh, in this hearing, we have the burden of proof uh, as the applicant appealing. Uh, we have, we uh, are essentially uh, disagreeing with uh, the values enrolled by the assessor's office. Uh, property tax rule 321 states Subject to exceptions set by law, it is presumed that the assessor has properly performed his or her duties. The effect of this presumption is to impose upon the applicant the burden of proving that the value on the assessment roll is not correct, or where applicable, the property in question has not been otherwise correctly assessed. The law requires that the applicant present independent evidence relevant to the full value of the property or other issue presented by the application. Uh, if the applicant has presented evidence and the assessor has also presented evidence, then the board must weigh all of the evidence to determine whether it has been established by a preponderance of the evidence that the assessor's determination is incorrect. Uh, the preponderance of the evidence evidentiary standard uh, is essentially the 50-50 standard. If you believe us a little bit more uh, than you believe the assessor's office, then uh, you should be granting us uh, the reductions to the value. Uh, next, we have the value concept. Uh, we're talking about uh, the value for property tax purposes. The words full value, full cash value, cash value, actual value, and fair market value mean the price at which a property, if exposed for sale in the open market with a reasonable time for the seller to find a purchaser, would transfer for cash or its equivalent under prevailing market conditions between properties who have full knowledge and, uh, of the uses to which the property may be put both seek to maximize their gains and now they're being in a position to take care of the or take advantage of the exigencies of the other. Um, so that's really important uh, for our case here today. It's the full cash value. It's, it's what you would sell this equipment for as of a certain lien date. Uh, we're gonna be uh, showing a lot of evidence uh, demonstrating the fact that uh, the market variables essentially uh, lean towards uh, disposable equipment, essentially. Uh, so what we're looking at uh, for the Vons case, for example, uh, all of these uh, stores have an economic interest to keep a, a clean and beautiful grocery store. Uh, they also have an interest to have their own uh, branded identity, essentially, within the, uh, the assets they place in their store to kind of keep you know, uh, continuity with their theme uh, and their message. Um, because of that, uh, we have thousands and thousands of grocery stores across the United States, all full of equipment uh, that they need to refresh uh, from what I've seen about every five to seven years in order to keep up with market trends. And none of them want to buy each other's equipment. 
So what is that, uh, what kind of effect does that have on the full cash value, on our market value, on our opinion? Uh, that essentially makes it so that that equipment is, has very low residual value. And for the purposes of property taxes, that would mean that the value is not, uh, it's not appropriate to use the reproduction cost or the historic cost uh, that the assessor uses. Um, so if we continue on, uh, there's also, uh, so that first part was rule two. Rule three provides several methods for calculating fair market value, uh, but for this case, the cost approach will be the focus. Uh, rule six outlines the steps to take when estimating fair market value through the cost approach. This is the default method used by assessor's office when valuing business personal property, and it is also the method that has been used by the applicant for the case being, case being, here, being heard today. The rule states that the cost approach is used in conjunction with other value approaches and is preferred when neither reliable sales data nor reliable income data are available and when the income from the property is not so regulated as to make such cost uh, irrelevant. So uh, it's particularly appropriate for construction uh, work in progress and for the property that uh, is essentially brand new. Uh, the further away you get from the uh, purchase date for an asset, the uh, less likely. Uh, the cost approach is to match the actual uh, value, the actual full cash value of that asset. Um, additionally, rule six states that uh, reproduction or replacement cost shall be reduced by the amount that such cost is estimated to exceed the current value of the reproducible property by reason of physical deterioration, misplacement, over or under improvement, and other forms of depreciation or obsolescence. Uh, the percentage that the remainder represents of the reproduction or replacement cost is the property's percent good. Uh, so continuing on, uh, we're also going to be presenting guidelines from the SBE and CAA. Uh, essentially, the point we're going to be stressing here is that the lives used by the assessor's office are uh, established through guidelines. Uh, they're not strict. Uh, they are guidelines, and um, if there is evidence of additional obsolescence, adjustments should be made. Uh, continuing on, uh, we have the cost approach. Uh, so in the cost approach, every year taxpayers, uh, you know, essentially report the cost of the assets they, that, that they have. Uh, the assessor then indexes and trends them. Um, uh, through that process, they're able to estimate uh, a, a remaining economic value, or economic life value. Um, and with that, they're able to, the assessor's office is then able to estimate remaining value and then tax uh, based on that. Uh, the assessor's office has applied percent good factors in accordance with the guidelines recommended by the CAA, which state that grocery store equipment should be valued using a 12-year average service life. It is the applicant's opinion that these factors do not account for the rapid depreciation of this equipment due to all forms of extraordinary obsolescence. Furthermore, the assessor's valuation is significantly inconsistent with the life expectancy guidelines established by Marshall and Swift, the IRS, and also uh, we pulled in some data from other states as well. Uh, so on the next page here, we have uh, the introduction for our reproduction cost new, uh, or what we're, the point we're gonna be making with the reproduction cost new. So uh, one of the biggest issues that supermarkets have, uh, if you can imagine the situation, uh, we have uh, how many here uh, today in, in Ventura? Uh, about 21, it seems. Uh, so we have about 21 appeals per year in Ventura. Uh, they, Vons has stores all over the nation. Uh, retail and grocery stores have, this, have a, a large issue with this, is actually recording their disposals. Uh, we've often run analysis before, and we've seen that according to the assets that were on the fixed asset detail, uh, you would see a grocery store that should be having their shelving three stacks high. Uh, it, this is a common problem. Uh, it's a problem that we've been seeing since the early 2000s. I know I'm pretty young, but um, you know my, my dad was also involved with this. Uh, he's had this issue since the 90s. Um, and it's been a continuing issue. It's very difficult for stores uh, with the quantity of stores they have and the quantity of assets that they have, individual assets that they have, it's very difficult for them to go through and accurately dispose everything for all of their grocery stores. Uh, we believe that our adjustments are helping to capture some of that inefficiency. Uh, we're hoping that we're able to reduce uh, 
some of the stacked costs that should not be there. And we believe that our approach effectively uh, captures that and makes an adjustment for it. Uh, the change in life table. Uh, so according to SBE, uh, the recommended life guidelines were established based on Marshall and Swift and the IRS publication 946. However, after referring to both publications, we find this claim to be inaccurate. For retail equipment, Marshall and Swift recommends a life of seven to 11 years. IRS publication 946 recommends a life of nine years, also for retail equipment. Uh, both publications are included in exhibit five for reference. And uh, the next step in our research was to find out what guidelines other jurisdictions across the country were recommending for the equipment category. Uh, while we did not verify the guidelines for every taxing jurisdiction nationwide, we believe that we have obtained an acceptable sample of what guidelines should be used for the supermarket equipment category. Uh, we have Harris County, Texas, Fort Bend County, Texas, Maricopa, Maricopa County, Arizona, uh, Colorado Division of uh, Property Taxation, Florida, and uh, the state of Tennessee. And we can see that we're having a, a range between seven to 10 years, uh, mostly with the uh, emphasis on the you know, seven to nine year range. Uh, so next we have external and functional obsolescence. So uh, this is gonna be some extra market data that we have. Um, one of the things that kind of drives down, uh, aside from uh, this continuous shuffling of equipment uh, in these grocery stores, aside from that, we also have uh, the development of new equipment for grocery stores. Uh, we're, beginning, we're beginning to see uh, changes in the footprint of grocery stores, uh, ranging in square, from square footage size uh, to the uh, technology implemented. Uh, we're seeing a lot of grocery stores starting to come out with uh, uh, completely tillless uh, type of designs uh, where you walk in, it tracks you, it takes your app, and then uh, when you walk out of the store, it automatically charges your bank account based on whatever you picked up or put down within the store. Uh, these sort of changes are going to be starting to uh, become more popular in the future. We're already seeing a change, or the, the beginning of this change uh, we've been seeing it since 2016, and uh, we don't believe that the trend will be slowing down anytime soon. Uh, another issue that uh, we'll be uh, bringing up with the external and functional obsolescence will be uh, federal guidelines, uh, specifically when it comes to refrigeration. Uh, those are demonstrations that we have. Uh, when we take a look at refrigeration for uh, grocery store equipment, it's a major cost component. Uh, obviously, refrigerators take up a large uh, portion of racking and space within the building. Uh, they take up a lot of electricity, and they're more expensive than your uh, standard off-the-shelf well, off rack. Um, but uh, we'll also be presenting information showing uh, how federal uh, regulations uh, gives uh, refrigeration external obsolescence, at least in the United States. Uh, opinions from industry participants. Uh, so over the years, we've had many different uh, witnesses and we've talked with many different people within the industry and we have uh, various opinions that we'll be able to show uh, from the industry participants. Uh, essentially, they will be testifying to the fact that uh, the grocery stores do not uh, keep their equipment for more than seven to 10 years most of the time. Um, they'll also be testifying to the fact that um, when these uh, assets are disposed of or sold, uh, it's often in an auction format and you often get pennies on your dollar for uh, any, any assets that you sold. So in conclusion, uh, in contrast to the applicant's market research, the uh, assessor's office has relied on the CAA recommended SBE 12-year average service life for grocery store equipment. Uh, neither the CAA nor the SBE has provided uh, documentation for the recommendation to use a 12-year average service life for this category of equipment. Uh, to the best of the applicant's knowledge, neither group has performed an economic life study to support uh, a 12-year life. Uh, in 1996, the SBE released its letter to assessors, LTA, discussing the guidelines for the economic lives assigned to each equipment category uh, per policy 10. The LTA states that the economic lives are based on the knowledge and experience of ASD's auditor appraisers, opinions of assessors and their staff, 
and information from various industry sources. In most cases, they were not based on actual studies of the average service lives of any of the listed groups of equipment. The LTA also states that the guidelines are not to be cited as an authority in assessment appeals hearings. An assessment appeals case should be decided by applying the appropriate uh, property tax statutes, regulations, court rulings, and sound appraisal practice to the pertinent information available for the situation in dispute. Uh, if we skip down a little bit there, uh, what this case comes down to is fair market value. There is a general idea of how long the equipment can physically last and how long the equipment stays in service on average. But the true goal is to find the equipment value after each year of use, as of each lien date. Based on the market data, it is the applicant's opinion that using a 12-year average service life to value this type of equipment is too conservative. Uh, the board is not required to choose between the opinions of value promoted by uh, the parties to the appeal, uh, but shall make its own determination of value based upon the evidence properly admitted at the hearing. Also, uh, subject to exceptions set by law, it is presumed that the assessor is properly performed. Just, I think I pretty much read that before. Um, so if we want to continue on to page five here, and page six, we essentially have our opinions of value that we're going to be presenting uh, for each of the appeals. We have 19 and 20, both listed in this narrative. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit on how we came to our opinion of value real quick. Uh, so essentially what we've done uh, is we have taken Marshall and Swift to find uh, a replacement cost new. Uh, we have adjusted for local and state mo uh, uh, locational modifiers. And uh, we have found that on average, uh, Marshall and Swift indicates that a brand new grocery store at the top end of their range uh, should uh, be, be able to be built out for approximately $66 per square foot. Uh, we'll be seeing in our uh, opinion of value exhibit where we go into the math that uh, some of these stores can uh, range from 90 to $120 per square foot. Um, I'm not sure if there's 120 in this exact uh, case, but I've seen that before. I've even seen up to $220 a square foot for a grocery store, which is completely ridiculous. Um, so what we've done is we have taken a replacement cost new uh, from Marshall and Swift. Uh, we shorted it up with some new store openings that we've had for Vons uh, close enough to the lean date. Uh, we've found uh, essentially that Vons can uh, get within the range detailed by Marshall and Swift. Uh, so then we've taken a cost adjustment uh, to adjust the cost to that uh, dollar per square foot level, and we've adjusted the store supplies category uh, to a uh, nine-year life. Uh, so when we go and uh, look through our opinion of value, that's what we're going to be seeing. We're going to be seeing an adjustment uh, to the cost, and we're going to be seeing an adjustment to a nine-year life. The, the adjustment to the cost is to capture... Uh, the, the value of the equipment uh, uh, in a way that uh, if we replaced it all with brand new equipment, we should be able to find uh, 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 the value from there. <laughs> Excuse me. And then um, we also adjusted the nine-year life to come more into line with uh, the recommended uh, service life from the IRS, uh, from what we've seen in the industry and what we've seen from uh, uh, other states. So uh, if we want to continue on to exhibit two here, references. So I'll just go through the highlighted stuff pretty quick. Uh, these are all references from the BOE. I believe that we have uh, some assessor's handbook in here as well. Uh, so these are essentially uh, uh, state resources that we have that help to detail uh, the rules and uh, uh, where we're going. Uh, so on page one here, we have the burden of proof. This is essentially uh, detailing the preponderance of the evidence uh, that I mentioned before, wherein 
Uh, if we have anything beyond a reasonable doubt, a 50, if we win the 50-50, essentially, uh, then we have met the burden of proof and our value does stand. Uh, if we want to continue on to page two here, you know, we have another uh, rule 324 from the BOE. Uh, this is also uh, just detailing the full cash value. The bottom portion there says the board is not required to choose between the opinions. Uh, this was also detailed in the narrative. Uh, if we continue on to page four here, uh, we have the definition of full cash value, which I also read. Uh, and this is uh, extracted from uh, section 110 uh, for the property taxes law guide, revenue and taxation code. Okay, and then uh, on page five, the value of intangible assets and rights related to the growing concern value of a business using taxable property shall not enhance or be reflected in the value of the taxable property. Uh, so that's essentially saying, uh, you know, if you think that Vons's equipment is worth more because it's Vons branded, then that would be a tangible value. And you should not be ascribing that value to it being Vons's equipment. If the principle of unit valuation is used to value properties that are operated as a unit and the unit includes intangible assets and rights, then the fair market value of the taxable property contained within the unit shall be determined by removing the value of the unit. If we want to continue on here to page 10, uh, here is another example of the value concept, which I've already read. Uh, page 11 uh, details, uh, it's a publication from the BOE, uh, detailing rule three, the value approaches, uh, part C here, uh, the cost of replacing reproducible property with new property of similar utility or or of reproducing the property at its present site and at present price levels, less the extent to which the value has been reduced by depreciation, including both physical deterioration and obsolescence. So essentially, uh, another, I, I feel like this might be a good time again to talk about the difference between reproduction and replacement cost. Uh, under the idea of reproduction cost new, you are reproducing the exact item uh, so say you have a Coca-Cola machine, right? Uh, it, in some cases, you might want to reproduce the Coca-Cola machine because it might have been the best Coca-Cola machine ever. But uh, at the same time, you could also go and buy a new Coca-Cola machine that can uh, produce the same number of units, but it should be cheaper with time uh, because the equipment should be getting more efficient with time. Right? or there should be new processes or ways of doing it. Uh, and so essentially our approach that goes with the replacement cost approach is uh, you know, accounting for that uh, development over time. The reproduction cost can actually get more expensive over time depending on if the technology is still available or not. Um, but uh, it is also not a very good uh, indicator in most circumstances when a prudent uh, business person uh, would be trying to maximize their profit. They wouldn't go and reproduce a machine that doesn't offer them any tangible value into the future if they have uh, a more useful or cheaper alternative. Uh, on to page 12. Uh, this is going right into what I was saying, the reproduction and replacement cost approaches to value. Uh, so on A right there, we have the reproduction or replacement cost approach to value is used in conjunction with other value approaches and is preferred when neither reliable sales data nor reliable income data are available and when the income from the property is not so regulated as to make such cost irrelevant. So uh, we wouldn't typically consider the income approach in this situation. Uh, when you go in value most of the time, you want to uh, consider all three approaches to value. Uh, uh, we wouldn't consider the income approach in this situation because it's very difficult in personal property to ascribe income to any given asset. Uh, typically, you wouldn't ascribe, uh, you wouldn't uh, perform an income approach on a bulk of assets like racking or something like that. That, that doesn't explicitly create income. Uh, also, uh, the sales data. Uh, we have had sales data in the past, and we kind of are using a. Uh, 
it, well, it's Marshall and Swift, so I'm not going to say it's it's sales data, right? But it's it's market data that Marshall and Swift, uh, a trusted source, has aggregated over the years. We're using that, which we can kind of say uh, might represent uh, market data. Um, but uh, we also have in the past performed analyses where we have uh, uh, used reliable sales data. Uh, like I mentioned before, most of the time, uh, grocery store equipment disposition is performed during an auction. Uh, most of the time, the assessor's office doesn't like that because it would be considered a forced sale. And a forced sale would uh, not follow rule two, uh, where you have to have a open and fair market transaction uh, that where both have had full time to make their sale. Um, there are exceptions to that uh, if the market in which an asset sales is uh, a forced sale market, uh, then you should be able to make an exception for that market. Uh, in our case, we do see that most of the time with grocery stores. Uh, we have talked with people uh, and we have uh, witnesses that have testified over the years uh, to the fact that they do sell uh, almost exclusively in an auction format because there is too little value otherwise. Uh, going on to E here, we have the reproduction or replacement cost uh, shall be reduced by the amount that such cost is estimated to exceed the current value of the reproducible property by reason of physical deterioration, misplacement, over or under improvement, and other forms of depreciation or obsolescence. The percentage that the remainder represents of the reproduction or replacement cost is the property's percent good. Uh, so if we want to continue on here, uh, this next portion here is the Assessor's Handbook, Section 501. This is basic appraisal. Uh, this is a reprinted edition from 2015, which I believe is the most, uh, the most recent edition. Um, uh, so on page 14 here, we have the economic concept of value. Uh, it is important to distinguish between the concept of market value and uh, another value concept known as use value or value in use. The concept of use value is concerned with the value of property based on its utilization by a particular owner or group of owners. Uh, the, per, the appraisal of real estate defines and describes use values as use value is the value a specific property has for a specific use. In estimating use value, the appraiser focuses on the value the real estate contributes to the enterprise of which it is a part without regarding to the property's highest and best use or the monetary amount that might be realized upon its sale. Uh, so property tax appraisers in California with certain exceptions set forth in the next chapter are required by the California Constitution, statutes, and regulations to appraise property at market value, the value at which it would sell on an open market. As of, a, as of a particular lien date. So continuing on here uh, to section 502, uh, uh, you can see on page 16 here that we are now breaking into advanced appraisal. Uh, this is the December 1998 edition, and I believe that this is still the most recent one for advanced appraisal. Um, uh, continuing on to page 17 here. Uh, it is important to distinguish between the concept of market value and other value concepts uh, known as use value or value in use. The concept of use value is concerned with the value of property based on its utilization. Okay, uh, this is uh, pretty much an excerpt from the previous one as well. Uh, it is clear that the standard of value for property tax purposes is market value and not value in use. Uh, so it's not as... Uh, use value describes, it is not the value a specific property has for a specific use, it is the value that the property will have when traded on the open market as of a lien date. Uh, on to the next page here. Uh, one means of estimating reproduction cost uses the historical or original costs incurred by the property owner during the construction of a structure or a fixture. When using reproduction costs to appraise new construction, appraisers should distinguish between uniquely useful properties and special purpose designs for which there might be a market. Historical or original costs for owner-occupied properties may reflect specialized designs, building materials, expedited construction schedules, or other items that would not be currently recognized by the market for such properties. Under certain conditions, these abnormal costs may reflect value in use rather than value in exchange. 
So this is important uh, for what I was mentioning, right? Um, in the grocery store uh, realm, uh, they tend to uh, get their own equipment. Uh, they have their suppliers worked out. They have everything streamlined, and they have their things uh, uh, branded, individualized, and uh, in theme, right? Uh, so essentially, some of these costs uh, are going into uh, following that theme. Uh, and valuing that would be uh, valuing the, the value in use, uh, whereas we are trying to value the value in exchange. So uh, that branding actually hurts the value of the equipment, uh, at least when it comes to other stores and other large retailers purchasing it. Uh, continuing on to the next portion here, we have Assessor's Handbook 504. Uh, we can see on page 20 here, the replacement cost is the cost to replace an existing property with a property of equivalent utility as of a particular date. The replacement cost concept is the most meaningful as far as the principle of substitution is concerned. Uh, on to the next page here, I can bring up principle of substitution if I'm not getting ahead of myself. Uh, functional obsolescence here. Uh, functional, so there are several different types of uh, obsolescence, uh, functional and external are the two that we're going to be talking about uh, for now. Uh, functional obsolescence is the loss of value in a property caused by the design of the property itself. Uh, when the capacity of a property to perform the function for which it was intended declines, functional obsolescence is present. Uh, functional obsolescence may include such things as changes in taste in the marketplace, which is a valid factor, especially when it comes to the aesthetics of a grocery store. Changes in equipment design, materials, or process, or poor initial design. An example of materials or process would be like the refrigerators that I mentioned, uh, where uh, they've not only become more efficient for energy standards, uh, but the new uh, refrigerators are also more efficient, which would uh, affect the value of the old refrigerators that are more electricity hungry. And there's also the external obsolescence, which is the next portion, which is uh, what I mentioned with the uh, federal guidelines uh, for chemical use and electricity use as well. Changing technology commonly creates functional obsolescence for machinery and equipment, and some functional obsolescence can be or should be considered normal to varying degrees. Older machines and sometimes newer machines or entire lines of equipment, even though still in use, may be made obsolete by new technologies and manufacturing processes, and the market value may be reduced because of functional obsolescence. Functional obsolescence may be less tangible or visible than physical deterioration, another form of obsolescence. Um, but it may be more significant. However, it may be curable. An element of functional obsolescence is considered curable when the cost to correct the deficiency is less than the resulting economic benefit. When the cost to correct the deficiency is greater than the resulting economic benefit, the element of functional obsolescence is considered incurable. Then we have external obsolescence, also known as economic obsolescence, is a loss in value resulting from adverse factors external to the property that decrease the desirability of the property. Uh, this type of depreciation may include the loss of value due to inflation, interest rates, legislation, environmental factors, reduced demand for the product, increased competition, changes in raw material supplies, increasing costs of raw material, labor, or utilities without a corresponding price increase of the product. Loss in value attributable, attributable to external obsolescence is usually beyond the owner's control and is most, mostly atypical depreciation. It can, however, be normal in industries where markets have shown long-term, sustained, and predictable shifts, such as the market for semiconductor and other high technology equipment. It can be identified by studying the overall market conditions for a property. For example, if the output of a machine is superseded in the marketplace by output of a different material, and the market no longer absorbs the superseded output, then the machinery has suffered external obsolescence. So uh, in the case of grocery stores, uh, we could essentially be making the argument for uh, physical depreciation and functional obsolescence. And uh, the refresh cycles that we're seeing in grocery stores, uh, they make the choice to keep their, uh, their stores beautiful and clean. It's an economic choice, economically driven choice. 
uh, and that essentially um, produces a glut of equipment on the market. Um, and also the equipment itself as it ages, it's, it's publicly handled equipment, so it does go through some physical deterioration uh, that I do believe you know, supersedes the 12-year life that the assessor's office is using, because uh, considering that we're going based off of the economic value, the, the, the exchange value of the assets, um, uh, grocery store equipment that's been kicked around or nicked or beaten uh, does not typically sell very well. Uh, continuing on here, uh, to page 23, uh, here is a State Board of Equalization letter from 2010, uh, guidelines for substantiating additional obsolescence for personal property and fixtures. So the highlighted portion here is important. It says, the tables are intended to promote uniformity of assessment for use in mass appraisal. However, appraisers should be cognizant of how to recognize and measure additional obsolescence in personal property and fixtures. After receiving numerous inquiries from county assessors, staff, and assessees in reference to recognition and measurement of additional obsolescence in personal property and fixtures, staff drafted these guidelines in consultation with interested parties, and after discussions, the guidelines were approved by the board. So the guidelines discuss methods of recognizing and measuring additional or extraordinary obsolescence for personal property and fixtures. So essentially that first part is, is, is what's really important here. Uh, the tables are intended to promote uniformity of assessment. So this is essentially a way of, uh, an easy way for the assessor's office to be able to assess property across the state effectively uh, across the state every year or across the county every year. Uh, it does not, it's not a rigid structure. There's no law saying that you need to be using the 12 year life. Uh, it's a recommendation. And uh, what we're positing is that we believe that the nine year life is more accurately reflective of the value of uh, grocery store equipment. So if we wanna continue here to page 26, uh, this again is, uh, it's going into a little bit more detail of uh, the, the summary that was given on the first page. It says here on page 27, mass appraisal is the process of valuing a group of properties as of a given date using standard methodology for tax purposes. Use of mass appraisal by county assessors is supported in a court decision which in part found that after considering the circumstances and the various factors influencing value, it is the assessor's duty to exercise a prudent discretion in reaching conclusions. The magnitude of the assessor's task, appraisal and assessment of all property within a limited time, demonstrates the necessity for him to promulgate general rules, formulas, and percentages for depreciation, construction costs, square foot area charges, and other factors in order to secure uniformity. And we do not begrudge uh, the assessor's use of the cost approach in this case. Uh, we begrudge the use of the 12-year life for the store equipment. And it says here in bolded, uh, in the highlighted portion, relevant data pertinent to the assessment of a specific property should always be reviewed and considered because the value determined by use of data contained in AH581 may need to be adjusted for actual available market data. And it says that it should be reconsidered if there's a subsequent appeal filed. Uh, continuing on to page 28. Uh, in the absence of reliable sales data, the cost and income approaches assume greater importance. Additionally, pursuant to Rule 8, subsection A, the income approach, uh, it's the preferred approach for the appraisal of improved real properties and personal properties when reliable sales data are not available and the cost approaches are unreliable because the reproducible property has suffered considerable physical depreciation, functional obsolescence, or economic obsolescence, or a substantial over or under improvement is misplaced or is subjected to legal restrictions on income that are unrelated to cost. However, if there are neither comparable sales nor reliable income data available, the cost approach becomes more appropriate. This goes into the detail where uh, each appraisal uh, approach should be carried out independently uh, from the others and completed on the basis of market data supporting that approach. Um, this should be derived from the, from the market and uh, the process of resolving the differences among value indicators is called reconciliation. 
and reconciliation, the appraiser should consider the various factors influencing value. They're not uh, reflected or only partially reflected in the value indicators. Uh, so this is kind of uh, detailing what I mentioned earlier about our considerations for the other approaches and what kind of uh, information we had available and what we could do with personal property. Uh, continuing on to page 30, uh, here's more detail on the replacement costs. Uh, so I've talked already a bit uh, about replacement costs from the assessor's handbooks, and uh, this is from the BOE for the guidelines for substantiating additional obsolescence. Uh, since I've mentioned this before, I'll go through this a little bit more quickly. Uh, replacement cost approach is finding uh, an existing property with a property of equivalent utility as of a particular date. Um, and uh, the reproduction cost or the use of historic cost is essentially uh, finding the, the, the value of, of the historic value of the equipment. It's not showing what the uh, present day, as of the lien date, the value is. Uh, variations of the cost approach. Uh, so the indexes and percent good factors provided in AH581 are intended for the use in mass appraisal for property tax purposes. Uh, in most cases, it is a practical method for mass appraisal purposes. When using the factors and valuation method contained in 581, an appraiser should not only estimate a full economic cost, replacement cost near or reproduction cost near, and consider all forms of depreciation that apply to a particular property, but should also be aware of the limitations inherent to this approach. It is important for an appraiser to recognize the limitations of the cost approach in regard to a specific property because adjustments may be needed or a different approach to value warranted. The annual business property statement allows property owners to identify all property specific conditions that would warrant adjustment. Uh, supplemental information that may be presented by the assessee may be valid whether or not submitted with the business property statement. However, in order to ensure that the evidence is considered, it should be submitted prior to the enrollment of the assessment. Otherwise, it might only be considered if a timely assessment appeal application is filed. So uh, continuing on, uh, page 33 here, I'll, I'll start speeding up through this one a little bit more. Uh, we have functional obsolescence again. Uh, these are, again, uh, detailing physical deterioration, functional obsolescence, and external obsolescence. Uh, we're showing that there's changing technology. Uh, we're also showing that they refresh quickly. Uh, we're showing that the states are recommending uh, a seven to nine year life. Uh, we're also showing uh, external obsolescence and where we go into our grocery store equipment, or our, excuse me, our refrigeration equipment. Uh, continuing on to page 34 here. Continued operation or continued profitability does not necessarily disprove the existence of external obsolescence or indicate that no external obsolescence exists. So uh, that's something important. I, I'll, I'll detail it a little bit more again. Uh, so, so when we're finding our, our value in exchange uh, for our equipment and we're seeing what it would sell for on the open market, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the equipment uh, needs to be at the end of its life if it's at the end of its economic life uh, according to the uh, table that we're using. Uh, the economic life uh, demonstrates average economic value for equipment over the course of time, right? Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, an asset on a 15-year table, at the end of 15 years, it should just, you know, break and fall apart. Uh, it's not necessarily what it means. Uh, that equipment could still be there at the end of its uh, useful economic life, uh, and it could still be useful in, at the end of its e uh, useful economic life, uh, but the residual value may not be there. Uh, and then page 53, the last page here. Uh, an appraiser cannot assume that the cost approach or any valuation approach automatically provides the best indicator of value. All available information must be analyzed to determine the best indicator of value. 
uh, when available or possible, it is best to compare the estimated value to actual market value of similar property to verify accuracy of results. So uh, these next couple of exhibits are going to be leading in essentially to our exhibit six, which is our opinion of value. Uh, we're gonna start with exhibit three here, uh, which is gonna be titled Marshall and Swift Cost Manual. Uh, this is one of the exhibits that's gonna be uh, unique for 2019. Uh, we have the 2020 Marshall and Swift Cost Manual exhibit on, on hand as well that we can pass out at the end if you guys would like. Uh, so we're gonna go through here real quick. Uh, so, so we're going to be using this uh, to find uh, a max adjusted replacement cost new. Uh, so if we look at page one here, uh, we have uh, Marshall and Swift's section 65, page nine from March of 2018. Uh, this was the most recent, or this was the most recent uh, publication uh, for our appropriate for our lien date. Um, we can see here at the bottom right down there, uh, complete equipment for a typical supermarket ready to open for business costs thirty one to fifty one fifty per square foot of gross market area. So. Marshall and Swift is seeing that to outfit the equipment in a grocery store, you should be having a range between $31 to $51.50. Now, our red uh, demarcation at the top, that's added by us. Uh, that's uh, indicating the value that we're ultimately going with uh, between $64.81 to $65.88. Um, I think of the differences between Oxnard and Ventura, the location multiplier is slightly different between the two locations. And um, so essentially we're taking that, uh, I believe it's the 5150, so we picked the absolute top range of uh, Marshall and Swift's uh, re uh, replacement cost for a complete, uh, a complete equipment uh, outfitting for a typical supermarket. Uh, if we can continue on to page two here, uh, we're seeing the life expectancy guidelines published by Marshall and Swift. Uh, we use the nine year of life uh, we can see retail trades, fixtures, and equipment uh, should be somewhere between seven and 11 years. Uh, we use the nine-year life uh, to pick that happy middle. Uh, if we continue on to page three, uh, we have the depreciation, fixtures, and equipment. Uh, so what we're going to be doing with this, uh, this uh, is uh, Marshall and Swift's depreciation table. Uh, when we went and we're going to be calculating in our opinion of value, uh, the value of the equipment, uh, we take the depreciation uh, of the equipment based on its average age. After uh, we uh, apply the, the square footage uh, calculation to it. Uh, page four here is uh, going to be the uh, current cost multiplier. So we have 1.040. Uh, essentially, we took the averages between the refrigeration and store sections. Uh, we did the refrigeration uh, as the secondary portion because it is a, uh, a significant cost component to grocery stores. Uh, so we have both of those categories averaged to get to our current cost multiplier of 1.04. Uh, then continuing on onto page five here, we have our local multipliers. Uh, we can see the differences here. We have Oxnard and Ventura. I believe that we went with class D or class A. I believe it's class D, it was a typical grocery store. Uh, so we will go more back in, well, we'll go back into this a little bit more uh, when we get to the opinion of value. I just kind of wanted to, to introduce the numbers uh, that we used for that portion real quick uh, so that you're familiar with them when we get back into them uh, in the opinion. Uh, if we continue on to uh, uh, exhibit four here. So this is our uh, new store RCN summary. So essentially what we're doing with this, uh, we're using this to find an adjusted RCN dollar per square foot for store openings uh, for Vons and Safeway 
Um, I believe that we picked specifically ones in California mostly. We did. Uh, in this example, we have almost all, Cal or all California. Uh, we have some in San Diego, Alameda, San Mateo, Contra Costa, Los Angeles, Orange, Mo and Monterey. Uh, so we have demonstrations from across uh, the state of California. Uh, and essentially what we're doing with this, uh, we're demonstrating that the uh, cost that is cited by Marshall and Swift is, uh, is, is uh, accurate. Uh, it can be uh, described as an accurate um, uh, range uh, that we would see for a typical Safeway or Bond store. Mr. Gengloff, could you just tell me what the acronym RCN stands for? Uh, yeah, so it depends on, okay, so this one, uh, this would be the, um, this would be the reproduction cost new. Did you say reproduction cost new? Uh, one second. This is a replacement. This would be the replacement cost new. I'm sorry, I'm hard of hearing. Could you please repeat that? Yeah. This would be the reproduction cost. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so essentially what we're doing here, uh, we're taking the original cost and then we're indexing it up uh, to find our reproduction cost new. If we were finding our replacement cost new, we would have to be finding uh, the value of new assets uh, with a like or similar utility uh, that you'd be acquiring in the future. Uh, that value would uh, most likely be lower, but seeing how this is in a, uh, essentially uh, in an indexing of a historical cost, uh, I would say that this would be a reproduction cost new summary. Um, and uh, these are for new stores. Uh, so uh, this would be reproduction cost new essentially uh, because we are taking the uh, opening costs of the stores and uh, we're then indexing them up. Uh, we're finding reproduction cost new dollar per square foot of $64. Uh, we have the location adjustment of 4% according to Marshall and Swift. Uh, that calculation was found by taking the uh, locational adjustment uh, that we uh, reviewed in the past exhibit in exhibit three. And, um, uh, and then uh, comparing the two. So for example, on this first, uh, this first one, we have San Diego. Uh, so our location adjustment in Marshall and Swift would be the, the difference between uh, the location uh, adjustment for San Diego and the one for Ventura. Uh, so we have a, an ad a locational adjustment of 4.07% for this first example, and we're seeing an adjusted reproduction cost new dollar per square foot of 66.65. Reproduction cost new. Yes. But before, oh yeah, no, very yes. good. Yes. Yeah. So these, so yeah, so reproduction cost new is used uh, when uh, a property is brand new. Yeah, it's the historical cost, yeah. Uh, so if we look through our examples here, we have uh, new store openings. Uh, we can see some, uh, some of these are, you know, somewhat dated, but I believe that our further ones kind of get closer to the present. And you can even see that some of the ones in 2017 and 2016, we're even down to 40 and $55 a square foot. Uh, our most recent one of 1-9-2019 was at $69 a square foot, and that was up in Monterey. Uh, but uh, to be noted, that is a 23,000 uh, square foot store, and there might be some economies of scale uh, involved with that. Uh, typically, when I'm making estimates for grocery stores and I see a 20,000 foot store and my average is around 45,000 square feet, I can see about a 10 to 15% adjustment. Um, it's not an adjustment that we've made uh, in this example. As you can see, it's still up at about $69 per square foot, uh, which is a little bit higher than our Marshall and Swift, but like I said, it's a bit smaller of a store, about half the size of a normal store. 
So our examples are showing a range of $66, $59, $55, $60, $63, $65, $55, $60, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65, $65,
The economic lives for various equipment categories are primarily those developed by the CAA for use by county assessors in mass appraisal programs designed to derive the market value of personal property and equipment within a band of value that meets California property assessment appraiser standards. So one thing I want to note on is this is supposed to be used in mass appraisal and that we understand that the assessor can't go to every subject property and look at the equipment. But when the taxpayer does present evidence of the subject property of why these lives need to be reduced, we think it needs to be taken into account. So on page eight now at the top, something important to note about the CAA and how they derive some of these tables is subsequent to the adoption of the economic lives by the CAA, in January 2000, property tax staff conducted an in-depth analysis of the CAA recommended economic lives. The two publications were primary used for this analysis were Marshall and Swift and the Internal Revenue uh, Service publication 946. For comparison, the economic lives published in Marshall and Swift Service and IRS publication 946 were added to a spreadsheet that contained the CAA lives. So again, we are using as one of our parameters of why there should be a nine year life is Marshall and Swift valuation services, as well as what the IRS um, publication 946 states. We'll get into it more, but then our third is also other tax jurisdictions and what those tax jurisdictions are using to value this equipment and what economic lives. And then below, I don't wanna be too redundant, but essentially, you know, this states again that all of these lives are supposed to be a guideline. This isn't law, this isn't, we have to do this. It's, it's an initial guideline in the mass appraisal process. Once we get to specific industry data, that should be taken into account. So then um, at the bottom, it says cons to alternative one, only a portion of the economic lives recommended in alternative one are the result of an in-depth lifing study. The remaining economic lives were developed from one, auditor appraiser knowledge, information gathered by various counties when valuing property, and results from county assessment appeal hearings. So again, we believe you know, there needs to be even more analysis on why these lives are recommended. So if we go to page 10 now, we kind of briefly touched on this in a previous exhibit, but um, Marshall and Swift, we have retail trade fixtures and equipment. It gives us a range of the life. So it has a range between seven and 11. And we thought, you know, a nine year life in the middle was um, appropriate. And then if you go to the next page on 11, this is from IRS publication 946. If you look, um, it says distributive trades and services includes assets used in wholesale and retail trade and personal and professional services and includes section 1245 assets used in marketing, petroleum and petroleum products. And then this also has a nine year life. And as I previously stated, when the CAA came up with their economic lives, they specifically said they used Marshall and Swift and IRS publication. <clears throat> So on the next page, this is a letter to the assessors. Essentially, what happened was um, in the assessor's handbook 581, they were thinking about recommending economic life. Um, so if you look at the highlighted part, it says currently assessor's handbook 581 does not contain economic lives, which would allow users to be able to determine which percent good factors in assessor's handbook 581 to use to determine the taxable fair market value for the various categories of property and equipment. So um, they were thinking about adding these economic lives in Assessor's Handbook 581. And again, they even stated if we um, put these in to Assessor's Handbook 581, this would be a guideline. So that's kind of what that highlighted part on page 13 says. And then if we continue to page 17, here, um, we're gonna, the next couple pages, we're gonna look at emails that were sent to Sherry Kinkle. And I'd like to note real quick if we, um, yes. Mr. Gangloff, at the top of page 13, there's a, a marked draft. 
Um, can yes. you explain what that pertains to? Yes. So, like I said, they were thinking about putting these economic lives in. It wasn't finalized. Okay. So this was the draft that they drafted up. And you'll see why um, it didn't become finalized because um, if you, like, continue on to 17. So Sherry Kinkle, and just real quick, um, on page 12, it says, comments should be provided um, by October 24, 2008 to Sherry Kinkle or mailed to the above address um, for interested parties to talk about this. So essentially on 17, we kind of show the interested parties, uh, the taxpayers, and um, their concerns with having economic lives in the assessor's handbook. So if we go to page 18, one of the concerns from the taxpayer reads, the proposed table undermines the assessor's duty to estimate fair market value and diminishes the presumption of fairly assessing the property before county assessment appeals board. From a practical standpoint, assessment appeals boards give great weight to the assessor's handbooks. Therefore, if the assessor deviates from the handbook, the presumption of correctness is called into question. Thus, the proposed table becomes more of a prescription than a guide. Further, erroneous life tables are an invitation for litigation resulting in a diversion of county resources to defend the assessor's assessments. So then if we go to page 19, here's another um, email to Sherry Crinkle from Michael McCrary. One of the um, issues you know, they had was, for example, all food processing m and &E should not get a 15-year life. Even though according to CA engineering is considered taxable, I can't sell the engineering costs associated with my equipment. Another issue I have is how are these tables established? Is there a study that was conducted or something that would validate the lives established? And then if you continue to the next page, another um, email to Sherry Crinkle. Um, it says, having the California Assessors Association dictate the direction of life tables could create self-prophesizing positions amongst some assessor personnel or even counties. So then if you continue to page 22, it says incorporation of the CA economic lives in the 2009 handbook would also, would, would also have the potential to undermine SBE's credibility with the courts. Guidelines published by the SBE are usually held in high regard. The courts, however, are unlikely to blithely follow the proposed economic lives when the issue paper acknowledges that this proposal is just a starting point until the SBE staff obtains better data, kind of what I've been talking about. It's a starting point in mass appraisal, but when better data is given, that should be taken into account. So then economic lives are only guidelines to assist taxpayers and assessors with the mass appraisal of property. Most importantly, the burden of proof on the taxpayer to prove the property's fair market value must be insurmountable. So th then here's a letter to um, you know, the interested parties and in dealing with the economic lives. And it says, as a result of input from interested parties, economic lives will not be included in AH 581. Interested parties indicated that a wholesale adoption of lives should not be undertaken by the board. Again, these are all just guidelines. When more data is present, that's what we have to look at. There has to be a starting point. We understand that the assessor has to use mass appraisal to value a bunch of different companies. But when we come in again with more data, we would like them to look at that data. So then if you continue on um, page 24, so this is um, the CAA says, um, this paper is a result of work by CA Business Chiefs Association having met to arrive at a uniform set of equipment index percent good and valuation factors. These tables are recommended for use by all California Assessor Association members in order to promote uniformity in the assessment of business property. Again, this is just for uniformity and mass appraisal purposes. <clears throat> and then if you look, even the CAA on page 25, they say if an assessor has property or industry specific appraisal data that in the assessor's opinion will produce a more precise appraisal of the subject property, then it is recommended that the assessor apply the more precise data. And then kind of what I was talking about how the CAA is supposed to update these lives annually, this is 
you know, information that we have that refutes this. If you look on page 27, you have um, the CAA Economic Lives as of January 2000. And, you know, we highlighted a couple of different um, categories. So you have aerospace, 12-year life, apparel manufacturing, 12-year life, ATM, 12-year life, barbershop, 12, beauty salon, 12. Now, if we continue to page... And all of these, all of these uh, assets, uh, we pick these specifically because they're all the ones that are on the 12-year life, which is the life that is shared by our grocery store equipment. And then if you continue to page 33, this is the same position paper, but for January 2019. And if you look at page 34, you have aerospace, apparel, ATM, barbershop, beauty salon. All of this is still on a 12-year life. If this is supposed to be updated annually, you would think there would be changes because industries do change. But the CAA hasn't changed anything. It has not been updated. So then if we continue to page 40, again, just to kind of establish how we came up with our nine-year life, we looked at Marshall and Swift, we looked at the IRS, and then we're also going to be looking at other tax jurisdictions. So that's where we're at now is looking at the other tax jurisdictions and what they are valuing this equipment at and what they have as the economic life. So on page 40, you have Harris County. This is in Texas. Um, and if you look on page 42, they have this on an eight-year life for a supermarket grocery store and supermarket independent, both on an eight-year life. If you look now on page 43, this is for Fort Bend. This is another county in Texas. And it has furniture, fixtures, shelves, displays, equipment, retail stores, um, and a bunch of other things. But if you look at the age life on the left side, they have this on an eight-year life as well. Now, if we go to the next page, this is Maricopa County. This is in Arizona. So we have food, grocery, meat and fish, fruit and vegetable, candy nuts, confectionery, dairy products, and miscellaneous food stores. They have this on a 10-year life. Now, if we go to the next page, this is Colorado. The wholesale retail personal property, they recommend a nine-year life. Again, if we continue to page 46, um, this is Florida. And if we go to retail trades, fixtures, and equipment, they have this on a nine-year life as well. And then finally, on the last page, this is for Tennessee. Um, and if you look, the what we highlighted, it's uh, furniture, fixtures, general equipment, and all of their property not listed on another group. And this is also um, consistent with a seven to eight year life. And so that, that concludes our section dealing with the economic life. Um, Nathan will go into a little bit more the calculation, how we came up with our opinion of value. So we can continue on to uh, exhibit six here. So uh, if we continue on to page one, uh, here is uh, our location summary. Uh, these are for the Vons companies, the 2019 location summary for Ventura County. Uh, we can see the store number, that's the internal store number uh, on the first column. Second column is the address, followed by the city. Uh, that's the assessor's account number. Uh, we have the appeal numbers, and then now we start getting into the meat. So first we have the square footage of each store. Uh, you can see here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, typically uh, you're approaching 40,000 square feet, somewhere uh, mostly in the range between 45, uh, 45, 50,000, uh, somewhere in there on average. Uh, we've got a couple that are smaller. The, smaller, the smallest one that we're looking at is 22,000, uh, which as you can also see in the next column after that, or the two columns over from that, uh, that one has a reproduction cost new dollar per square foot of $103.70. Uh, that's kind of uh, 
a, a little bit of it's, uh, testifying a little bit to the uh, square footage problem I mentioned in our comp that was closest to the lean date. Uh, it's, it's a bit smaller of a store and it also happens to have uh, the highest uh, reproduction cost uh, new. Uh, so continuing on to the uh, column next to square footage, we have our reproduction cost new. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's just the, the cost essentially uh, indexed up. Uh, next to that, uh, we just have a simple division uh, between reproduction cost new and square foot. Uh, you can see here that uh, most of them are above our 6588 uh, marker that we have in our next column. And uh, this is a good comparison. Uh, these two columns are, are good for seeing uh, what kind of issue we're looking at here. Uh, we have our new store opening information. Uh, this max replacement cost new dollar per square foot is the uh, amount that we found using Marshall and Swift. It's what we've adjusted our costs to. And uh, you can see that uh, we've demonstrated that we've been able to open stores near or at this 6588 per square foot, brand new. Uh, it's common, and we can see that uh, over time, as time has gone on, uh, the reproduction cost new for the assets on the books, on location, uh, bring the values of the stores up quite a bit. Uh, we're seeing $90, $80, $103. Uh, there are a couple on here. Uh, that are slightly lower uh, at 64.81 in that max replacement cost new dollar per square foot. Uh, those are the ones that I mentioned are slightly different because of their location in Oxnard uh, since they have a different uh, location adjustment value uh, supplied by Marshall and Swift. Uh, so continuing on here, uh, I believe that this portion of uh, these next three columns are the assessor's uh, role. Now we have the breakdown between fixtures and personal property and our total values. And so I believe that we're seeing a value of 22.7 million on the roll uh, in total for 2019. Uh, for 20, uh, the next three columns are our opinion of value. Uh, these are demonstrated, are demonstrating the uh, adjusted cost, uh, uh, the adjusted cost uh, just very initially, and also the adjustment for the nine year life. And then finally, we have our opinion of value, which is uh, about 14 million. If we want to continue on, if we just want to flip that page right over and go to page two. So um, I'm going to give you guys an example, and then we can decide how much further into it we want to go. So pages, pages uh, two through, four, excuse me, pages two through 14 uh, are going to be uh, one valuation. Uh, so each of the valuations are gonna be taking approximately that many pages. about 12 pages, I believe. Um, and what we're looking at here on page two, uh, so first we have uh, the information for each company. Uh, the, on the first page of each valuation, uh, you'll be seeing this, all of the valuations are laid out the same way. Um, I'll walk through one, and I believe it'll be uh, you know, pretty self-evident what's going on with the rest of them. Uh, there are a couple of caveats that I will cover, um, but Mr. Gangloff, when you come across an acronym like BPP, if you can also just state what it stands for in your tables. Okay, yes. Um, so, so we have the description up here at the top, then we have the assessor's cost approach. Uh, the first section is going to be the category. These are the categories that the assessor assesses. Uh, they uh, break uh, assets down into different categories and assign lives to them uh, using their tables. Uh, the next two columns, this fixture percent and business personal property, uh, uh, denotated as BPP. Uh, these are uh, percentage breakdowns. They're essentially allocations uh, for cost values between fixtures and business personal property. Uh, the next column there is going to be the table. 
Uh, by table, uh, we mean the uh, commercial trend that, we'll, that we will be using for each of these categories. Uh, for example, here, COM12 is a commercial 12-year life. Uh, COM10 is a 10, 8, 5. Uh, PC is its own category. Uh, they depreciate really fast, but it's of little importance. Uh, POS equipment, UTC8 is also its own category. Uh, not going to be the greatest focus here, uh, et cetera. Mr. Gangloff, just one question here. Are these column three tables, are they taken from what the assessor or is this, is this your columns? Those, uh, those tables are the assessor's tables. So those are the assessor's trend tables uh, that they use to depreciate their equipment every year. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you'll see a slight difference uh, between the top and the, the upper and the lower portion there. So this first section is the assessor's cost approach and the bottom portion is the revised cost approach. So we do have one table that is not uh, the Ventura County's table directly, but it is one that they could use. Uh, that COM9 under store equipment is a commercial nine-year table that we used. We pulled that table from the CAA recommended gu guidelines. Uh, so we have uh, essentially uh, the table that Ventura County would use if they were to use a nine-year life. Uh, that's the only difference that we have. Um, so they wouldn't have that explicitly in their documentation they send us for their trend tables every year, but uh, it would be something that they would reasonably use. Uh, I don't think that there would be an alternative. Maybe they might. Um, the next column there is the acquisition cost. Uh, we can just see that this is an aggregate of the acquisitions over, over the years. So uh, the store equipment, uh, the, that equipment might have been purchased over the course of five years. Uh, but uh, for this purpose, for the acquisition cost, this is the sum total. Uh, and then we have the fixtures and the personal property. Uh, those two columns are already depreciated. So we have a 3.3 million historical cost. So if you just took the sum total of all the assets there and what you paid for them, it would be 3.3 million. If you then depreciated them according to the assessor's trend tables, according to the life that is being ascribed to it, in this case, the store equipment, on that COM12 under the assessor's cost approach, you had uh, come to a value of an, uh, an assessor's role value of 1.565 million. So uh, below that, that revised cost approach portion, uh, that's where our changes come in. Uh, this assessor's cost approach should uh, reflect exactly what the assessor should have, uh, it should follow their lives, and it should follow their trends and their, their asset categorizations, et cetera. Our revised cost approach does also follow uh, the historical cost, but it has been adjusted. So you can see here that that column, if we go category under revised cost approach, if we go category, fixture percent, BPP percent, table, adjusted cost, that doesn't say ACQ cost, which is acquisition cost. It says ADJ cost, adjusted cost, right? And so this adjustment is the adjustment between what we can see even further below between the original revised $91 and $22 per, uh, $91 .22 per square foot and our revised adjusted cost of $65.88 per square foot. So that adjustment was made to every category. Uh, you can see that our acquisition adjustment costs are different by a fixed uh, value. I believe that in this case it was about 22%. Uh, we did not make an adjustment to supplies, uh, feeling that would be unnecessary as they are supplies and they are meant to be used in that one year. Um, we also have our table there uh, under store equipment that says COM9 instead of COM12. You can see uh, how that might have made a greater adjustment uh, to, uh, to the value than, uh, than just the adjustment to the cost that we have. And you can see that our opinion of value down there at the bottom right of the revised cost approach is about $889,473 for this store. So below that, um, this is the Marshall and Swift approach. This is the information that I said that we might be pulling out exhibit three, four later. Um, 
you guys have any questions about this, we can pull it back out and I'll, I'll show you where it matches up. But uh, all of these values are just the values that were in Marshall and Swift, like uh, the highlighted values that we, that we pulled. So we have a max replacement dollar per square foot at 5150. As I mentioned, we picked the highest range of the value uh, presented by Marshall and Swift. Uh, then we did the current cost multiplier using the categories that I mentioned. I believe it's stores and uh, refrigeration, right? Uh, then we have the local multiplier. Uh, this is specific between Ventura and Oxnard. Also in the Marshall and Swift exhibit, you can see that we've highlighted both. And we've applied the appropriate one to uh, whichever location it is. Uh, now we have found our max replacement cost new dollar per square foot. And our replacement cost you know, for opening a new store would be $65.88 with a square foot uh, square footage of 38,709 square feet. We should have a max replacement cost new of $2.55 million. Now with our $2.55 million, we find the, uh, the difference between the original our, uh, reproduction cost new essentially and our new revised replacement cost new and we can see that the RCN is $90 and our revised value is $65. And therefore our adjustment is the difference between those two applied to all categories except for supplies. Um, so if we continue on to pages three uh, through 14, I can detail what all of these are for you real quick. Uh, these are essentially our trend tables. Uh, so, uh, maybe page three wouldn't be the best example. Page four is a great example. So on page four here, we can see uh, the cost approach uh, for store equipment. Uh, we can see here that we have the assessor's cost approach. Oh, and this is perfect because it will also demonstrate our difference with our COM9 table. The uh, store equipment, uh, we can see uh, Category, year, the first section, assessor's cost approach, and then the second section, revised cost approach. Uh, on the first column of the assessor's cost approach section, you can see that it says table, and then it says column 12, which is indicating that the assessor is using a 12-year life table on that. Uh, you can then see uh, two columns over, that trend factor. That would be the trend factor uh, that the assessor would publish or use for a COM12. And then uh, you can see on, under the revised cost approach, that first column has the reclass table where we're showing that we switched it to a COM9 and we're showing two columns over that we have adjusted the trend factor accordingly. Uh, so uh, we can also see going on uh, past trend factor in the assessor's cost approach, we then have original value, index value, and reproduction cost new. So we have the original value here and then we have the index and then we have the reproduction cost. So uh, acquisition cost multiplies into trend factor to find the original value. And then acquisition cost multiplies into the index factor to find the reproduction cost new. And then on the revised cost approach section, we have the COM9 table. Uh, we can see our adjusted cost. All of our costs have been adjusted by that ratio between the replacement and reproduction cost new that we found using Marshall and Swift and our uh, store opening data. Uh, and then we can see the difference in the trend factor and we can see the difference in our adjusted value because of that. Uh, it's uh, quite a bit lower because of the two adjustments that have been made to this category. Uh, and continuing on, we can see our index factor and then our adjusted RCN. Mr. Gangloff? Yes. The trend factor in the revised cost approach, is that a function of switching to the COM9? Does that it is, flow from that? Is that? It, it flows from that, the, the values you put in that column? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, um, so on the adjusted cost column, there, is, uh, there was an adjusted adjustment made that is not visible in the sheet. Uh, it's the difference between the acquisition cost and the adjusted cost. Uh, that's uh, what we were mentioning, that adjustment that was made to, make, uh, to find parity with the replacement cost new that we found using Marshall and Swift in our store openings. 
And then after that, then we have the trend factor there that's representing the COM9 table. So that would be the adjusted nine-year life. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, if looking at other categories, uh, for example, if we wanted to take a look at page five, this is a good demonstration. Uh, there's very little on here. Uh, find a better one. Let's, let's take a look at page six. So on page six, uh, we can see the other equipment category. I picked this only because there were more entries, so it might be a little bit easier to tell what's going on here. Um, so we have the other equipment category. We're seeing that it's on a COM10 table. Uh, we can see under the revised cost, cost approach section that it is still under a COM10 table. So we have not adjusted the trend factors. You will see that the assessor's cost approach trend factors and the revised cost approach trend factors do in fact match. Uh, you'll see the index factors match, the index factors always match. It's only one index factor for a year. Um, but you can see that there is adjusted cost. That is where the cost difference lies. So the assessor's cost approach, the acquisition cost, the sum total of that is 100,221. Uh, 100, and we can see that the adjusted cost under the revised cost approach, that sum is equal to 72,383. And as I said before, this adjustment was made to bring it into line with uh, the replacement cost that you would see uh, for a normal grocery store using Marshall and Swift uh, compared to uh, store openings that we have been able to compile for Vons themselves. Um, do you guys have any questions on this section before we move on from it? Because um, everything else is going to be the same between them, between the, the rest of the, uh, you know, uh, workups. <clears throat> okay. So. I have questions, and maybe I, I wasn't sure when I should butt in, but I, I have questions for everything leading up to right now that I haven't spoken haven't asked, but I would like to, before we get too farther on, and you're both, Mr. Gangloff, uh, this first question is for Nathan, and yes. I have questions for Ricky later. Okay. In your introduction section, um, you talked about, but I didn't quite understand, and maybe you're gonna bring it up later, mm -hmm. you talked about three stack high shelves, oh. and, could, is that going to be discussed later? Or? No, no, that won't be. That won't be. I can, I can, I can. Yeah, just speak to that a little bit for me. Yeah, okay, so, so I, I've been handling this personally for seven years now, um, you know, but I've been, like, working with my dad a little bit, like, you know, I've, I've been hearing about this for the past 20, right? So uh, this was actually an exercise that they performed before they had the fixed asset details on computers. <laughs> you know, So my dad would tell me about it and he was like, yeah, it's literally impossible for us to keep track of all these books. We have all these assets coming in, coming out all the time. It's a full grocery store worth of equipment. Uh, sections of the store get rearranged. Some pieces get picked up and moved. Some, people, some things just get thrown out. A lot of, there's a lot of issue with recording disposals, right? So you'll see stacked costs year over year. So what we did was, uh, this is when I was like still pretty new, like they'd already done this before and I performed it myself uh, to, you know, cause it was a good example for my store in particular at that time, right? Essentially, uh, we took uh, a fixed asset detail and we showed that there was this much racking in the store, right? And we were able to verify that, um, you know, uh, one store allegedly had, you know, like 90 racks, whereas the store physically, in order to fit with fire code, you know, you can't just keep putting more shelves into a store. You have to have space between your aisles. It has to be, you know, palatable to the consumer. You know, like th that's a consideration, right? Um, they have to have it organized appropriately, and then there's the federal regulations like fire lanes, and then also with like uh, ingress and 
ingress and egress, you know, like just the ability to move around within the store. And essentially when we got to the end of our, uh, our analysis, we were like, okay, so legally speaking, you're only allowed to have say 30 racks in the store. And uh, through our uh, review of this fixed asset detail and then like going and checking what kind of assets were actually there, we were able to see that, oh yeah, there was literally three times more racks than there literally can be within the store, legally speaking. So you'd have to stack them three shelves high in order to fit all of them within the one store. Now that's like, you know, like nobody would ever do that. It's completely unreasonable. Like why would you stack three stacks high? And that was the issue. All of that was on the books and all of that was being assessed by the county. It was impossible for there to be three stacks of shelves high. It was impossible for them to keep that many shelves on the premises. And it was, a, it was an issue and I thought it was a, a, a great demonstration of the problems that the grocery stores have with retiring assets and disposing of assets. Thank you, I, I, yeah. I did not understand it that way. Mm -hmm. um, on section two references, you mentioned that an auction is typical for the disposition of these assets. It is. I was wondering when Albertsons and Vaughn's sold those stores to Hagen, did Hagen buy the whole kit and caboodle or was, were those assets, the, the uh, fixtures and personal property sold off via auction or were they sold to Hagen along with the store locations? Um. I'm not privy to that exact information, so I wouldn't feel comfortable okay. testifying to that. Um, but I, in my experience um, and my dealings with other people, we actually have a, a witness that we, we talk with very off, fairly often. And when the case is going in a slightly different direction, when we go with the store sales, um, we do bring that guy in and he does testify to the fact that that is the general method. It was in his entire business for 25 years. Uh, his entire uh, business was uh, disposition of grocery store equipment. Uh, he would go and perform the auctions and sometimes he would go and help with uh, cherry picking some of the best equipment that would actually be made to go to sale. You know, but then he would also turn around and be like, yeah, but approximately 80% of this stuff gets scrapped uh, Twenty percent sells, and then it's pennies on the dollar when it does sell. Thank you. Yeah. And Ricky, um, on your presentation, um, one of the things you talked about was um, a change in the, or a lack of change in the life tables between 2000 and 2019, and you highlighted tables that showed a 12-year life, I believe, yes. uh, a variety of things. Do you have any evidence about anything that occurred between 2000 and 2019? In other words, we, we know that they're now in 2019 and were in 2000, even nine, 10 years or 12 years, excuse me. Mm -hmm. But um, could I, I they think have I, been changed and changed back in that time period? I, I believe... Um, coming up in our presentation, we will show even just industry changes within retail. Obviously, we know there's been a lot of um, changes where there's online and not maybe as much foot traffic and stuff like that into the store. So we will get into a little bit more of that, if that's your question. Like the, I, I, I think to answer your question, I don't believe that in the time between that they have made an adjustment, to my knowledge, um, I'm pretty confident saying that they haven't made a change. I know that some counties have started making a change, like they, they've started kind of going with a 10 year life, but I don't think there's been any sort of publication marking that uh, directly. I'm, I don't believe that it has changed. Okay, and finally, Nathan, this is directed at you in this last presentation on exhibit six. You, I think you were speaking about page two, mm -hmm. and you said that you've got evidence here that shows that Vons can open stores at the $65.88. Um, could you, 
uh, I'm not clear where it shows up, where your evidence is uh, of uh, which, that. Which, ex which page two? Well, I believe you were speaking in Exhibit 6, exhibit page six. two. Gotcha. Um, and you, you spoke about the fact that you believe bonds has shown that they can open stores at that $65.88 range. Mm -hmm. But um, can you show me exactly how this page shows that? Of course, of course. Um, so it was uh, exhibit uh, is it four, three. I thought it was uh, uh, it's, uh, So I was referencing uh, back to exhibit four on this one, I believe. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's on exhibit four here. So, um, okay, so how did we prove that uh, we believe that we can use the Marshall and Swift value? So on exhibit four, on page one, uh, these are several examples of store openings uh, and information that we have from Bonds and Safeway or you know, the same entity, essentially. Um, so we have approximately uh, 10 store openings uh, that we've given in this exhibit four. Uh, this is the one where we had to clarify between the rep reproduction and replacement cost. Uh, since this is uh, detailing of the historic cost, it's a reproduction right. cost. Yeah. So essentially, uh, this adjusted RCN dollar per square foot, uh, you can go through our 10 comps and you can see uh, that the $65, 65.88, I believe, uh, yeah, the 65.88 that we are using, uh, that we pulled from the highest uh, values available in Marshall and Swift, you can see that it is somewhat reasonable uh, to assume that $65.88 would be uh, an adjusted uh, replacement cost new, essentially, reproduction cost new. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Does that does that clarify it enough? I believe so, yeah. Yes, it does. Uh, so I'll just uh, I'll just take a second to to clarify all of these again real quick. Um, so essentially our approach is uh, an adjustment to the nine year life for store supplies. And then uh, we are using Marshall and Swift to come up with a max replacement cost new value uh, using their factors. And we have supplemented the use of their factors to find a max replacement cost new value by demonstrating that when Vons and Safeway open their stores, the idea of a $65.88 replacement cost new is completely reasonable for their stores. And we've given 10 examples uh, with stores uh, from Vons and Safeway, specifically in California, to shore up that fact. Yeah. I understand this part, like uh, I've, I've presented this part before and I like, a board member after the hearing told me, he was like, I just didn't tie it all together. And I was like, I'll focus on that today, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. And if you recall in exhibit three, that's where, you know, that 5150 and those um, cost multipliers from Marshall and Swift, that's where we're getting it from. Is that, okay, mm -hmm. just wanted to double check. My question was really uh, when your brother, I presume, Nathan, or cousin. Said, <laughs> cousin, excuse yeah. me, stated that um, you have evidence that uh, not that what the Marshall and Swift number was, but that Vons could actually open stores at that number. And that's what my question oh, was, okay. which you did answer. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Sorry for over explaining. <laughs> Um, so, uh, does anybody have any more questions on the opinion of value or the math that got us there? Do you want to go? I just have one question uh, of clarification. On Exhibit 6, uh, page 1, mm -hmm. the chart, um, 
we have uh, in the in the middle there, little column reproduction cost new. Well, reproduction cost new and reproduction cost new per square foot. Mm -hmm. um, so is that is that the actual cost for those locations? Uh, that is the indexed cost. Okay. So that's indexed with with time. So mm -hmm. with reproduction cost, you're supposed to bring the cost. If you have the historical cost already, you're supposed to bring the cost uh, to the present using the index that is presented in okay. page 581. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Does the assessor's office have any questions of what they've presented so far, or do you want to wait till the end and do all the questions at once like we typically do? I think the assessor would prefer to wait until the end of the presentation um, okay. and have a little bit of time to confer um, before we ask any questions. Okay, Thank that's you. what I thought, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to take a second to, you know, get, get that out of the way while it was still fresh um, because, you know, we're gonna go back into uh, just more talking now. Hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, less numbers. Um, we have a request for a break. Should we take like a 10 minute break? Five minute, ten minute. The, the request was after they're done with their presentation. Do you want to wait or? We didn't need one. Just <laughs> so return at uh, ten forty-five. Let's do five minute break. Okay. We've been here for two hours. Yeah. Okay. And a problem. Usually we have a break by this time, just you know, from ebb and flow, but not. We could be here for a while.
speaking on the agenda, I see that there are different representatives for cases 28 through 47. Yes. Okay. We, and we can, we can clarify that all on the record. You're, okay. you're all good. You guys never got the, the secret, the cleanest secret still in the FCPA, right? You guys never got the awkward issue to deal with the culture. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I've emailed to the Marta and Angel about it a few times. Like, hey, a reminder, we never got the clean label, but you guys still are also the CPA. We are back from recess and we're partway hearing the applicant's presentation. And just real quick before we get into the continued presentation, uh, County Council brought up during the recess uh, some things I just wanted to clarify. The representative for the 2019 case is Property Tax Assistance Co. Incorporated, whereas for the 2020, it's Altus Group US Incorporated. I confirmed with the applicant's representatives. Um, Property Tax Assistance Co. was merged with Altus Group US, so it's still a legal entity, but they are um, representing both um, here today. And to either of you, Mr. Gangloffs, is that correct? My yes. summary? Oh, thank you for confirming. And then it was also asked uh, why um, two appeals for the 2020 year were in the name of Albertsons versus um, Vaughn. So we have 10 appeals for 2019 and 10 appeals for 2020. Um, but two of them for 2020 is under the name of Alt uh, Albertsons. Um, and just to confirm um, with the applicant's representative, that was just due, I think you filed some of these as under affected party and so forth, but Albertsons, Vons, and so forth, they're all owned by the same parent company. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you for confirming. Right. Back to you, Chair. Okay, whenever you guys are ready. Okay, so uh, we're gonna group up the next three exhibits here. Uh, exhibit seven, eight, and nine. Uh, we can just look at them all together. Uh, so essentially, uh, we can start with seven here. Uh, this is an Albertson sale. So we've shown you uh, store opening information and I've mentioned uh, that we are performing uh, uh, we're finding the fair market value of the equipment as of a lien date, uh, which would be the uh, value in exchange. Uh, on this uh, exhibit seven here, we have a, 2000 Alberts, a 2018 Albertson sale. So this is the other side of the coin. This is what I, I mentioned earlier about uh, how when this equipment sells, it's essentially for pennies on a dollar. Uh, so this is an example, uh, an example of a sale from page one here. Uh, we can see it's a SAM auction. Uh, I apologize, I don't know that acronym. Um, continuing on, on page two, we have uh, the terms of the sale. And then on page three, we actually have uh, what was an Excel sheet uh, that uh, describes each of the things that were sold in this auction as well as the sale price and it applies the internet premium and it also includes the sale date. So if we continue to page four here, uh, this is gonna be the important page of this exhibit. 
Uh, the rest is going to be a uh, demonstration. Uh, we can see on page four at the very bottom there, our total. Uh, so this entire grocery store, which we can see on page five was being assessed at a total of $741,000. At the time of its sale, all of the equipment in its store was sold for $49,000. So between pages four and five here, we can see what was actually received for the, uh, the assets that were left at the end of a store's life. And on page five, we can see what the county was assessing that store that very same year. So the county believed that there was $741,000 worth of assets, when in actuality, they were able to muster $49,000 for it. The next, uh, the following pages, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Uh, these are all the assets. Uh, this is the complete auction listing. Uh, these are the assets that were recovered from the store. Uh, we can see that there's racking, et cetera. We can see that some of these, uh, a lot of these racks literally sold for $5. Uh, I don't know how uh, in depth we need to get with the rest of this. I think that the important part uh, was that page four and five uh, showing the actual sale price and then page five showing the assessed, uh, the assessed value. Um, yeah, and the rest is just gonna be more, uh, yeah. Um, it's, just, it's just the proof of the sales. And then at the end there, there's uh, also on pages 25, 26, and 27, uh, there's a little a little article detailing uh, the closure of the store. So it's just, uh, yeah. yeah. Mr. Gangloff, I missed something. Um, mm -hmm. The 741 is the, the addition of the business property and the fixtures at the store on the assessor's um, unsecured tax bill? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it's the business personal property and fixtures put together, 741,000, yeah. So this is what uh, was assessed for the personal property, right? And then when they actually sold all of their, all of their interest in their personal property that was inside the store, what they were actually able to get for that equipment was $49,000. So continuing on to exhibit eight, uh, we're gonna see the exact same thing. Uh, page uh, five this time has the total, and you can see that it was $26,000 sale price, $26,703 recouped. And we can see on the following page, on page six, that it was assessed at, at $550,000. So again, they recovered $26,000 on an assessment of $550,000. There's the detail again, and at the end there is another article detailing the closure of the store on page 39. Yep. Uh, exhibit nine is gonna be much of the same. Uh, uh, page three is gonna have our total this time. We're seeing a complete store disposition in 2018 of $23,487. And we can see uh, the unsecured property tax bill in Los Angeles of an assessment of $435,000. So just again, $23,000 recovered, assessment of $435,000. And we can go again to the end. And there should, uh, this one seems to be missing an article detailing its closure, but I'm certain its assets were sold. So those three are just uh, good examples showing us the other side of the coin. It's not the direction that we went, uh, went in with our uh, adjustment, but it, I do feel it is a very salient point. It does, uh, you know, properly illustrate the fact that this equipment as of a lien date, when it will be sold, 
is not going to be worth the 12 year life that the assessor's uh, office has it on. And the cost itself is already pyramid, pyramided in on itself and the equipment appreciates fairly rapidly. Like we believe all of these issues put together uh, warrant our adjustment. And we feel like our adjustment has been uh, well thought out and considered considering uh, the, the various variables. So continuing on to exhibit 10, we have our industry articles here. So uh, this is just gonna be some, some industry data, it's just some, some news articles that we went and found. Uh, so this is gonna be detailing uh, another one of those issues that I mentioned, which is going to be the, uh, the development of new grocery ideas, essentially, and bringing us into the future. So page one here. Uh, is a, a, uh, an article detailing Amazon's dash cart. So essentially, Amazon is continuing to evolve grocery checkout for a more shopper-friendly experience with the release of a new version of its dash cart. Uh, yeah, so these things even include uh, their own POS equipment on them. Some of them have their own scales even. They uh, you know, can, can take your card. They can track uh, the things that are inside of them. Uh, essentially, they're high tech, and the equipment of yesteryear will soon be phased out. Yeah, uh, just more in the article. I don't know how much we want to get into it. I'm describing the technology, like I think it's all very interesting, but you know, uh, the dash cart screen will now display images of fresh items, so potential advertising. Uh, other convenient checkout options that the Whole Foods banner has recently adopted uh, include Just Walk Out technology, which is what I was talking about earlier, how it'll uh, track what you pick up and put down within the store, and then uh, you can just walk out without ever pulling out your card or your phone or anything. It'll just, it just tracks you while you're in there, knows who you are, and when you come out, it uh, just immediately bills you. Yeah. Uh, the dash cart screen shows a real-time receipt of all items in the cart, and when shoppers are ready to check out, they simply exit the store through the Amazon dash cart lane. So they're uh, creating new efficiencies by getting rid of the entire checkout process. Um, they're developing new technologies to better serve their, uh, their clientele. And uh, these changes uh, will eventually phase out uh, all their equipment. Uh, so just continuing on, we can just see that uh, on page four, Albertsons is uh, rolling out a, an AI cart. Which should be very cool. That's similar to the Amazon cart that I mentioned. Uh, it just tracks essentially where you are in the store, what you're doing, what you're picking up, putting down, uh, and what you're, what you're buying. Uh, if we want to continue to page six, we just have another article. This one, I, I, I like this one personally. This is the one I was talking about with the screen and a scale on it. It's even got its own uh, skew gun. Uh, this is just talking about carts being developed. Uh, page nine is talking about uh, how the checkout line is a, a critical pain point for grocery stores and, and, and grocery store shoppers. Uh, when faced with the long line, 65% of shoppers will head towards a checkout line, and 11% will abandon the shopping trip altogether. So, uh, in the in the realm of grocery stores, it's very important for them to uh, you know keep their competitive advantage. Uh, all of the grocery stores, they literally spend money to make sure that their faces are fresh, their their stores are clean. Uh, their equipment looks new. Uh, they'll spend money going and refreshing their kiosks. We call those sometimes minor refreshes, uh, where a grocery store, in an effort to congregate uh, useful services, will open several kiosks. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll walk into an Albertsons and you'll be able to buy some glasses or something, prescription, right? Um, all the all the grocery stores are kind of competing to find like you know that sweet spot, what's an ideal kiosk, what's, a, what's an ideal uh, floor layout plan, what's an ideal way of doing this. And so these moves to shopping carts are going to be something that the grocery stores will explore. If these things become valuable to them, if it brings in more uh, customers, they will absolutely continue to push these. 
uh, if we want to continue on here, uh, page 11, just talking more about the smart checkout. Uh, page 13, autonomous grocery stores uh, coming to campuses. Uh, page 15, we're seeing MLB's first store powered by Amazon One with a just walk out tech, uh, technology uh, to, to debut in T-Mobile Park. Uh, page 17, uh, they're talking more about uh, just walk out technology and how that's going to be the future. Page 19, uh, the big wide debuts scan and go solution. So it's uh, very similar to just walk out except you scan and go. Uh, page 23, uh, it's also uh, detailing mobile self checkout where you just scan it from your phone in the store. And uh, yeah, page 25 talking about potential uh, more AI powered uh, shopping carts and automated checkout lanes. Yeah, if we continue through here, we're basically seeing a lot of examples of how uh, the grocery store market is going to be evolving in the next years. How these uh, changes are going to be rolled out, how they're being tried, and they've already uh, have been tried so far and we're waiting to see what they will do with those in the future. If we want to continue uh, to page 33, it's also talking about retail automation. Page 37 is also talking about retail automation. Uh, on pages on page 39 uh, that we're seeing this ep excerpt, we have seen standards generally tightening across the board and grocers are facing more and more exposure as they diversify their services and offerings. Uh, that goes back to what I was mentioning, how they like to test new kiosks and uh, floor plans and footprints out in order to find the, the most efficiency and uh, the greatest return on their investments. Uh, on page 38, this is also something I'd like to point out. Keeping food cold is a cornerstone of the grocery industry, which billions spent and with billions spent annually on new equipment, repairs, and maintenance. This reliance on refrigeration and its associated expense sets grocers apart from every other segment of retail due to a unique combination of costs combined with unique merchandising and regulatory challenges. Uh, those refrigerators, as I mentioned before, are uh, uh, key pain points when it comes to uh, uh, government regulations. Uh, page 40, California is the top of the regulatory iceberg, and officials there seem to relish the state's status as a trend center. For example, in late 2020, CARB approved what it called first-in-the-nation rules to curb the impact of powerful artificial refrigerants that pose a dangerous, a growing danger globally to efforts to contain the worst impacts of climate change and suggested that the rules could serve as a national model. Chemical refrigerants are fast acting super pollutants and the fastest growing source of climate gases in the world today. Uh, and, as Earth, uh, and as the earth grows warmer, people will need to cool food, medicine, and their buildings even more than we do today. We need safer alternatives to be deployed as fast as possible. Uh, Below here, we can see some detail about what, what California regulations look like. Uh, the regulations now in place in California are designed to reduce HFC emissions, hydrofluorocarbons, uh, by 40% below 2013 levels by 2030 and are described by CARB as the most comprehensive of their kind in the world. So uh, CFCs and, and HFCs and uh, the removal of those harmful chemicals uh, from refrigeration has uh, always impacted uh, retail refrigeration. Uh, I've seen uh, detail that we've had from the late zeros uh, detailing that. And just for County Council, CARB um, stands for California Air Resource Board. Uh, on page 43, we're just going into uh, uh, the debut of an eco-friendly or refrigerant for grocery settings. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, these things are always kind of developing. Uh, they have their emissions standards, they have the, the chemicals that they can use, and they have the, the, the power 
that they're allowed to, to, to draw. Yeah. Um, and as you can see from this uh, article, uh, over time they do keep creating new uh, chemicals and, and ways of, of achieving cooling. May I ask a question now? Mm -hmm. Mr. Gangloff, um, do you know, are these in grocery stores, the refrigerators on a 12-year table? I noticed you had columns here that suggested there was 10 and 8-year tables also in use. I, Yeah, I believe it's in the store equipment. So our adjustment would capture the refrigerators and that changed to the COM9. Um, but I don't believe that they have a separate refrigeration category. Um, I don't believe so. If you look at the categories, there's a category titled store equipment and the refrigeration would be involved in there. And that was the main category that we differentiated between the 12 year and the nine year life. So you are saying the refrigeration units are, have been assessed under a 12-year depreciation? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, page 45, going more into uh, refrigeration. Uh, Amazon developed a smart refrigerator. Uh, it can automatically scan for low stock items or expiring products and make refill orders using some of the same computer vision technology found in Amazon's cashier list stores. So they're coming up with, uh, you know, refrigeration that, that stocks itself essentially. Uh, I mean, you know, they don't have the, the, the framework yet to literally have a robot stack it on the shelf, but uh, it does keep track of itself and it does order its own replacements. Uh, of its of its items. Uh, if we continue on to page 47 here, uh, a remaining obsolescence factor, ROF, or an aggregate obsolescence factor can be quantified by comparison between the results obtained through the use of a cost indicator of value prior to the deduction for obsolescence and results obtained through the use of the sales comparison approach. This is a market-derived obsolescence analysis. Um, essentially, I've discussed this analysis of market-derived obsolescence with many appraisers over the years, and one thing we all agree upon is that one factor in the analysis is what's commonly called discount for ownership. It's a clunky name for a very simple concept that everyone is familiar with. Once you drive a car off the dealership lot, it's no longer new and cannot be sold for the new price you just paid for it. When I started selling equipment 20 plus years ago, this is on page 48, the rule of thumb for the cost of used equipment in the market was 50% of new. That rule of thumb was often used across the board to factor values of used equipment. Things have changed. Because that rule is no longer useful, many appraisers instead come up with values based on the cost less depreciation approach or tools such as a present worth table. While these tools are somewhat helpful, they most often do not come up with realistic values for late model equipment. The most accurate way to come up with fair market values are by finding actual sales that have occurred in the used equipment marketplace. These values can be used to reconcile any values calculated with other methods such as cost approach, indexes, or even a general rule of thumb. So that's, um, that's why we uh, demonstrated the store closures. Uh, this is saying, uh, the most accurate way to come up with fair market values to find actual sales. Uh, the sales that we have are under uh, uh, an auction setting, uh, which some might not find palatable, which I believe is because that is the method in which that equipment is sold. But this is saying that it is more accurate to take the sales price. Our sales price is indicating that it was approximately was it approximately 10 times less than, than the assessed value? Um, and that might be a difficult adjustment to make, especially if the, if the equipment is brand new, you know, still in place. But it is true, and like I said, all these places will go and build out their grocery stores, they put all this capital cost into it, and then they need it to be pretty and new, and so they keep uh, just scrapping that, taking it out, and putting new stuff in. 
and nobody else wants to buy each other's equipment uh, because that's not how that market works. It's branded, it's individual, and it's used so it doesn't fit their model. Um, so continuing on to page 49, we just have some detail about uh, computerized equipment parts. Uh, these computerized parts are often tens of thousands of dollars and take value away from the main equipment at a faster rate than was seen with older technology. So this is saying that even into the future when we have the fancy carts um, that are computer controlled, they should be depreciating faster because computers themselves depreciate faster. And the higher technology that you have so far as we've seen, uh, typically it should be depreciating faster because you should be coming up with a reasonable replacement that is more effective. Um, we've been seeing that slow slightly in the past, you know, couple of years, especially when it comes to computer. I believe it's called Moore's Law. Um, my computers are starting to slow down in their speed. They're not doubling every year anymore. But um, yeah, this should still have an effect on grocery store equipment um, for years to come. Um, yeah, so page 50 just details a little bit more of that. The end result is that when equipment goes from a status of new to use, there's now usually at least a, a 50% immediate drop in value. This discount for ownership is rarely less than 50% and can uh, often be more. The actual percentage, of course, depends upon the type of used equipment. Uh, page 51, we have more uh, details on Amazon Go. Uh, that cashierless uh, till list design, where you just pick up the equipment, or pick up your items and leave. Uh, on page 54, they mention beyond saving money on labor, Motukuri says uh, retailers could boost profits. A highly automated system could make ordering and restocking a breeze because cameras will track inventory in real time, eliminating cash registers will provide more space for inventory, he said, or allow retailers to rent smaller spaces. And all that customer data will allow retailers to target them with offers, discounts, and other enticements. Uh, so that tracking obviously uh, goes beyond, uh, you know, just being convenient for the grocery store or for the, for the consumer. Uh, obviously, the, the cart is going to be able to track what you buy. And in the case of Amazon, uh, who tracks big data, uh, they can then use that data to better your shopping experience. Uh, page 58, uh, we're talking more about uh, more industry articles. Uh, essentially, this is just talking about trends that are that are taking. You can see this is from 2017. Uh, they're experimenting with uh, digital experimentation, uh, uh, grocery saturation in the digital space, uh, center store migration. Uh, center store categories are already migrating online, and this migration is expected to continue. Young and digital, younger, newer, and more engaged digital shoppers adopt grocery-related digital technologies more quickly and will hasten the expansion of digital grocery shopping further. So another issue that we have, and the thing that uh, brings down uh, the value of grocery store equipment in the broader marketplace is the fact that uh, digital, digital sales have been on the rise. Uh, the fact that less people are spending their time going into the grocery store and are ordering their, uh, their goods online is uh, you know, bringing down the value of the equipment in those grocery stores. If there are less people that are going into the grocery store in order to buy their, uh, their, their, their items, and uh, that beautiful grocery store that's brand new, uh, that they refresh every five to seven years, is uh, not as thoroughly trafficked, then obviously there's an effect on the value of the equipment in the store. Uh, page 59 here, uh, we have the energy department today rolled out new energy efficiency standards. So this is 2014. Uh, they say that the rules will take effect in 2017. Uh, the new commercial refrigeration rules update standards from 2009 and will save businesses up to $11.7 billion on their energy bills over the next three decades. And it says that the rules will take effect in 2017. 
Uh, these changes kind of happen uh, frequently over time. We can see on page 61, I believe that this is the timeline of some refrigeration standards that they have published. Uh, we can see first down there, 2005, it was when it was the federal standard was adopted by Congress. Uh, the second standard in 2009, uh, the, it was actually effective in 2010. The standard was actually, the second one was effective in 2012. Third was introduced 14, uh, effective 17. And there is a new one due in 2020 and a, a potential effective date of updated standard of 2023. So these are regularly updated standards that uh, you know constantly kind of push uh, some refrigeration, uh, which is a major uh, grocery store cost component out of the state. Or in the in federal sense, out of the country. Uh, page 63, it's just saying the, the, the refrigerators, newer refrigerators are always gaining efficiency. Uh, page 65 is just detailing how, like, how that's going to affect the, the new standards will affect uh, retailers. Uh, you can see that they'll be using less energy per case. Uh, on the back of that page, on page 66, it says many case models will change and some will disappear. Existing cases are grandfathered in, but some of the refrigerated case models retailers have bought for years may no longer be available. The new regulations mean manufacturers will have to sunset a number of model lines. Food retailers will need to know how the equipment is changing and how to manage operating old and new cases in the same store environment. So essentially, uh, anything that gets aged out uh, can no longer be sold. You can still have it, but then what's the fair market value in exchange? If you cannot sell it in the US, then it technically does not have value as a refrigerator. Um, on page 67, uh, this is just talking more about how important refrigerators are. Uh, again, they are a major uh, cost component in a grocery store, and it is in a supermarket's best interest to make sure that their uh, refrigerators are efficient and uh, up to federal code. Yep. So if we want to continue on here, we can take a look at uh, Exhibit 11. This is just the fixed asset detail. This is the full fixed asset detail, I believe, for the stores for 2019. Uh, it's just, uh, there's not much really to talk about on this fixed asset detail. I think I would just say that uh, if you reviewed it, it would look very much like supermarket equipment. Uh, they have POS equipment, crate tables, check stand, deli stand, mixers. Uh, there's not really that much more to say about it, uh, but it is here in case you guys would like to review uh, the assets. Um, yeah, I really don't have too terribly much more to comment on it. The only thing that I would um, additionally add is if you do look at um, the costs, some of the more high item costs are those refrigerations that Nathan was discussing. So when it comes to that um, retail store equipment, majority of those high cost items are the refrigeration. Yeah. Uh, so that's the fixed asset detail. Uh, if there's any questions on that, I'll be happy, happy to answer that, but um, it's just the, the backup essentially. Uh, so now continuing on to our last exhibit, Exhibit 12, uh, Industry Letters. These are letters that we have gathered uh, in, uh, over the years uh, from various people within the industry. Uh, this first one here, I believe, is from Jerry Evans. Uh, Jerry Evans, is uh, he uh, worked at this company called Cornerstone Equipment Management. Uh, he handled... Uh, equipment uh, disposition for approximately 25 years. Uh, he's come to testify at some of our hearings when our, uh, our approach is based off of the sales of the stores of the auction equipment. And he comes to testify that that is in fact the, uh, 
the method of disposition for grocery store equipment, and uh, he has been doing it for approximately 25 years. Uh, when a store is scheduled for closure, we are contacted by the customer well in advance in order to schedule a visit to the location. During our visit, we conduct a physical inventory of the equipment available for sale, compare the inventory to fixed asset records for any discrepancies, and make a determination as to whether conducting an auction will be cost effective. There are instances where our evaluation determines that the store's equipment is not suitable for sale through the auction process. This can occur because the equipment is physically deteriorated, obsolete, or has little to no public demand. Our evaluation may determine that individual items or even an entire store is not suitable for sale. Selling supermarket equipment by auction is the generally accepted method for selling this type of equipment, and there are several reasons for this. For one, the buyers want to see that the equipment is functioning properly. If the equipment is removed and sent to an off-site warehouse, the buyers are unable to have that benefit. Additionally, deinstallation and transportation to a warehouse are not cost-effective and may prevent the equipment from ever being sold. Even if the equipment is refurbished and sold from our warehouse, it will typically sit there for up to a year or longer before it is ever sold. Second, it is widely accepted that selling supermarket equipment by auction yields fair market value. As I mentioned, Cornerstone is paid a commission based on the sale price, so we are incentivized to maximize that sale price as much as possible. Some of the factors that affect the resale value of supermarket equipment include age condition, regulatory compliance, remaining useful life, new technology, and supply. Due to the constant state of flux in refrigeration equipment, resale value today is substantially lower than what it was 15 to 20 years ago. Uh, this was dated 2020, by the way. Uh, this comes as a result of new standards pertaining to allowable refrigerants, efficiency, and safety standards. Brand new equipment imported from the Pacific Rim has been a major competitor to used American-made equipment in recent years. Although the imported equipment is inferior in quality compared to the American manufacturers, the lower price tag is attractive to the regional chains and small local stores who are the chief consumers at auctions like ours. It's my understanding that supermarket equipment is valued by the assessor's office using a 12-year economic life. While the equipment may be able to physically last that long, it does not hold the value indicated by the use of the corresponding trend factors. The 12-year table shows that, the, that this type of equipment has a value of approximately 65% of its original cost after five years, 35 after 10, and 15 after 15. Based on my experience, there is absolutely no scenario where these numbers are accurate. After about 10 years of use, this equipment has minimal value on the open market. Uh, so continuing on here, we have another letter here. Um, uh, this is basically reiterating the fact any asset can last longer than its expected average economic life, but has little to no value after a number of years. Uh, the depreciation tables at the floor do not take that into consideration. Uh, this highlighted portion here, in the first six months of, two, of 2017, 378 display cases were sold with an average recovery percentage of 0.5% of original cost. Uh, this is uh, dated in 2018, December of 2018, by the way. Based on the sales information, the asset reaches a 20% value at just under seven years with higher depreciation in the first four years. And then it, just to add on that, if you look below, it kind of shows what, um, what the percentage of the cost you would receive. So after year one, 70%, year two, 61, and so on. Whereas the 12 year economic life, I believe after year one, it would be at about 93 and year two, I believe, somewhere in like the 86, and so on. Uh, on page four here, this third section says, I located three full store sales of shelving. Sale one had an average age of shelving of seven years and record, recovered 8.42% of original cost. Sale two had an average age of shelving of 10 years and recorded 6.67% of original cost. Sale three had an average age of shelving of 12.5 years and reported or recovered 6.77% of original cost. 
Based on the sales information, the asset reaches a 20% value at just under six years with higher depreciation in the four, first four years with a slightly higher resale value as a percentage of cost than refrigeration, mostly because the metal is easier to recycle. Uh, all stores are evaluated and receive a review and updating where assets are or replaced, usually based on competitive advantage and new technology that will increase efficiency at the year five-year mark from opening date. The first remodel that generates significant asset replacement occurs at the 10-year mark from opening date. Then the same evaluation as was done at the 10-year mark is done every five years thereafter with asset replacement as needed. Closed store assets that are not in new condition are sold at auction individually and are not sold as a complete store. So this was the property tax manager for public supermarkets. Now here's a, an article uh, from Vons from 2003. Uh, they say they testify to the fact that they we, we can, uh, this is Vons, uh, we completely renovate our stores every six to eight years on average with a budget between two to $4 million. Approximately 800,000 of 1.5 million is for the purchase of equipment we plan to replace. Much of this equipment has limited or scrap market value. Some of the reasons we remodel are to keep up with convenient savvy consumer demands, energy and competition considerations, location and appearance of the store, foot traffic, et cetera. In most cases, Vons has experienced an increase in store sales after a major remodel of that particular store. It says that placing the equipment at 55% after 10 years is on the 15 year table. This, this is from 2003. Uh, and the assessor's office used to use a 15 year table for uh, grocery store equipment. I believe now that they use a, a 12, but this is from 2003. Um, yeah, I don't believe, I, I was thinking about your question earlier and I was like, I don't believe that the CAA guideline recommendation has changed though. Yeah. I caught that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I yeah. caught that and I was, but what, this is from Vons, and they're saying in 2003, they thought that- It was out of 15. 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I believe in, um, I believe it was exhibit five, we actually had the CAA guidelines from 2000, and that had 12. So if this was 2003, I think this was just Vons interpretation of it, but not what the CAA guidelines actually recommended. But we don't really know what the CAA said in 2003 or any of those intervening years. Not yeah. of 2003, yeah. but 2000, yes. 2000, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we are fortunate if we can recover 10% of our original cost after 10 years. Once the equipment is eight to 10 years old, the cost to dispose of the equipment is more than its value. The used equipment dealer pays us anywhere between zero to 2% of the original cost to haul our used equipment away. The used equipment dealers do not take our equipment. We scrap them at the site and Williams Service take, takes them to the dump. Uh, and then they go on to testify that our equipment could fetch about 50% and 10% after five and 10 years of usage respectively if the equipment is sold in working condition and as a complete store. If equipment is removed from the store, it is only worth scrap value because the cost associated with removal, refurbishing, and marketing is more than the value of the equipment in an as-is condition. Uh, from the various tables used by the assessor's office to value our equipment, the eight-year valuation table reflects a more realistic value of our equipment. Uh, the next page here is just another article. Uh, it's just talking more about uh, grocery stores and, and difficulties. After four to five years of usage, the equipment is dented from constant use. The paint begins to peel off. Water starts to leak from coolers and refrigeration. Equipment starts to rust. Coolers and freezers do not, do not maintain proper temperature. The non-skid floor is ruined, et cetera. Uh, the cost of individual pieces of equipment compared to the total cost of a store is small. Uh, it's important that all equipment is working at all time. 
at all times. Uh, if it does, then there can be spoilage. Uh, so grocery stores have a, an invested, a, a vested interest in making sure that the refrigeration is new and fully functional. Uh, if it's not, then they can lose a lot of uh, product, which can damage their business. Uh, in most cases, we replace the equipment because the cost to replace the equipment is less than fixing it. Yeah, it says the highest we would pay for five-year-old equipment is half the cost. Uh, normally, we would not buy 10-year used equipment, but then because it is junk. Uh, says that the use of a seven or eight year table would place a more realistic market value for grocery store equipment if sold as a complete store. If the equipment were sold individually, one would be fortunate to get 10 to 15% after five or six years of usage. About two years ago when Albertsons remodeled their store, we purchased all their equipment for $15,000 and opened our store. This equipment would have, or would have cost over $800,000 if purchased new. Uh, we're going to continue on. These are more industry articles, uh, or not articles, these are more industry letters. Uh, we can just keep seeing that they're uh, reiterating more of the same fact. Uh, only 20% of the total cost is the, the cost of the equipment, 80% of the total original cost of equipment for a supermarket. Yeah. Uh, this guy says that he has 1,000 uh, refrigerators stocked. Um, In a specific instance, we removed equipment from a store that was between three to five years old. The total paid for the removed equipment was only 7% of its original cost. So they said that in a three to five year old store to his disposition, they got 7% of original cost back. Uh, this is the most I've ever paid for used equipment, uh, supermarket equipment in this age group. Uh, for older stores, it's more expensive than to just buy new. says, with his 40 years of experience, that uh, at five to six years old, we can only expect to recover 10 to 15% of value in respect to the original cost. Uh, and anything older than 10 is zero to 2%. Says, I believe in my 40 years of experience is worth zero to 2% after 10 years of use. So we have more articles uh, or more uh, letters detailing much of the same. Uh, this one is kind of an interview. Uh, it says 2 to 8% of the original value again. Uh, if we continue on to page 11, we'll just start going through these a little bit quicker. Uh, fair depreciation schedule uh, would be in the 10 year range. Um, page 12, uh, this is another letter from PBI Market Equipment Inc. It's just talking about the difficulties of, of this equipment. Uh, this is the next part is a questionnaire that was returned from uh, Hussman Corporation. Uh, number six on here says, when refrigeration equipment is replaced, is there a resale value? Can you estimate the uh, value as a percentage? And you checked off the 5%. Uh, it's basically saying more of the same. Uh, page nine, or I mean, page 15, uh, number nine, uh, says that the economic life is seven to 10 years, uh, much that I've been um, testifying to so far. Uh, page 16 is uh, a, a letter from Lucky Stores, and I believe that it is uh, detailing much of the same thing. And it also uh, talks about the refrigerating cases a little bit and the uh, impacts that the federal regulations had on their equipment. And I believe that would be uh, our case in chief. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Does the assessor's office have any questions of the applicant's presentation? Uh, we do. Would it be possible to take a 15 to 20 minute break so we can uh, confer on the questions that we'd like to ask? Yeah, we can do that. There, you there come, was quite a bit of information presented. Come back at 10 to noon. 
That'd be great. Okay. Or would your board just want to do an extended lunch and start? Or do we want to do lunch at this point and come back in an hour and then That's questions? Fine too. And then, is that okay too? Because we're running about that time. Because um, your questions might take 20 minutes or so. Probably. Which at could least. put us out here at 12 15 and 12 30. Should we just do a lunch first then? And what time do you want to come back? At 12 30. Is that okay? You need a full, okay. full hour good, then you can have a little bit of work time and a little lunch yeah. time. That's great. Okay. Well, we are going to break for lunch. Yeah. And we'll return at 1230. <coughs>
Good afternoon. We are back on the record, and now it is time for us to field questions of the applications presentation from the assessor's office. Real quick, Chair, um, before oh, we get yep. to questions, uh, we've just had some additional. Whoops, it's sorry. Time for us to um, additional exhibits submitted for the 2022 applications. I just want to identify those for the record, real quick. Um, the one with fixed asset detail at the bottom will be exhibit 13. The one that says opinion of value for the 2020 year will be exhibit 14. And the last one that says Marshall and Swift cost manual will be exhibit 15. And I didn't, don't know if, if you wanted to just get a brief overview of these from the applicant before we get into the questioning period. Yeah, we probably should do that just for the record. Did, did we say opinion? Did, did we say opinion of value is 14? Is that what it was? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, yes, opinion of value is exhibit 14. And then real quick, just to summarize, um, all the issues are the same, what we passed out. The only difference would be the opinion of value and the Marshall and Swift that we used. So that's essentially the only differences between the 2019 and 20. All the backup information, um, that would be exactly the same. So it's just okay. different values. And then also just one more thing that we'd like to put on the record. We did go back and look at the CAA for the 2003 year. It was not changed. We also looked at the 2006 year and the 2012 year just to kind of get a group of it, and it didn't change as well. So, Thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, that said, are we ready for um, the assessor's office to ask the questions? Uh, yes, we are ready to ask questions. Um, I want to start out with your opinion of value. Let's go page two on exhibit 14, or page one, I'm sorry. So if we look at um, stores of similar square feet, let's say uh, store 2094 which has 40,500 square feet, and store 2442, which has 41,430 square feet. Um, can you explain what causes such a large difference in the reproduction cost new of you know, similar square footage stores? Uh, could you please repeat the uh, two example ones that you mentioned? I have... 2094 at uh, 5275 Mission Oaks Boulevard. Uh -huh. And 2442 at 636 Ventura Street. So with uh, two stirs here, let me, uh, let me go ahead and take a look real quick. Before I make a definite answer, 
the reproduction costs new. Uh, you will see discrepancies, obviously, because of the way that the reproduction cost is uh, calculated for our purposes uh, and, well, for all purposes. Uh, when you're indexing, uh, the reproduction costs new, and you're uh, indexing those values up. Uh, if you have a store that has significantly old costs, then they will be higher on the index. And overall, the reproduction cost new will ultimately be reflected with a higher uh, cost per square foot. Uh, because they're indexed, uh, even if the costs might total something similar, uh, the differences in the age of the equipment as reported will uh, give you that variation in the uh, amount of cost or in the uh, cost per square foot. Okay, so it doesn't have anything to do with differences in equipment or you know, density of that equipment in the store or anything like that? Um, in two stores of the same square footage, to my understanding, uh, when a Vons builds out a store like that, obviously every building is unique and there might be some slight variation between the two of them. Uh, but for the most part, uh, Vons is a very uh, efficient process for building out a store and they have their own uh, method of doing so uh, with like where they place their equipment and uh, you know theme essentially right so i would not say uh, that in the case of two stores typically especially under the same company that a square footage difference uh, or that uh, a store that's in the same square footage uh, which would arguably have a similar footprint there shouldn't be much of a difference in the equipment involved okay um What, what are the dates that the uh, Marshall Guide that you used for applicable to? Uh, the dates that we used, um, I believe that the next update was in 2020 or 2021. Uh, each of the sections kind of has their own um, time period on them. And uh, we used the 2018 with the updated uh, cost uh, portion uh, to bring it up to the current date. Uh, our exhibit, for example, this Marshall and Swift and uh, applicants exhibit three. We can see at the bottom of the pages on page uh, one and page two, we can see that page one is from 3 2018, and that we can see page two is from 12 2018. And we can see the published date at the top as well, March 2018 and December of 2018. And our uh, page four, our section 98, page seven, was published in October of 2019. And you can see that it will bring uh, the cost from uh, April 2018, which was when they had their update uh, for those values up to uh, January 1st, 2019. And there is no adjustment to be made uh, from the December 18th page, uh, which would be on page two, uh, because that is right up close to the lean date of January 1, 2019. Okay, so, so then it's appropriate to use, use those current guides to adjust much older costs. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, especially when we're going off of a replacement cost new in our approach, because we are adjusting the historical costs to bring it in line with something that you would be able to open today. So our replacement cost of 65.88 is assuming that you'd be able to open a store at $65.88 a square foot. Um, we believe that using Marshall and Swift uh, to find a current cost multiplier for updating this manual to something that is appropriate with the lean date to then find our cost per square foot where we then adjust the cost is appropriate. Okay. Um, and my last question about your Marshall costs. Um, is there anywhere in the guide that recommends to adjust actual costs to the, the range that they give? In Marshall and Swift? Yeah. To adjust cost to their range. Um, I'm asking, is there anywhere that they recommend to use your method of evaluation where you adjusted actual historical costs to that cost from the guide? 
I do not believe that is strictly outlined in Marshall and Swift for personal property. Okay. Um, I, next question is about uh, refrigeration obsolescence. Uh, did you make any adjustment in your evaluation for the obsolescence that you're claiming to be extra for refrigeration? For the refrigeration? Yeah. Um, for well, all equipment in general that you're claiming extra obsolescence for? Um, I'm sorry, could you <laughs> can we start over real quick? Um, like, oh. It's off right now, yeah. Could you please repeat question? Summarize the question you heard and then repeat your answer, please. Um, could you repeat the question, please? Um, do your valuations include any adjustment for extra obsolescence? Do our valuations include adjustment for extra obsolescence? Yeah. Like, so uh, we believe that um, the difference between replacement cost and reproduction cost, uh, where that's the the, the cost adjustment that we applied to all the categories, we believe that that uh, captures uh, forms of obsolescence. Uh, we also uh, believe that our nine-year uh, change uh, more accurately reflects the life of the uh, equipment itself as well as the refrigeration, and uh, I believe that would also capture the obsolescence. Okay. So is your answer no? No, it's yes. It is yes. Okay. The replacement cost it. minus the reproduction cost is functional obsolescence. Okay. Yeah. That's so the difference. So we believe that our, re our, our changes to the value do reflect our, uh, they, they captured the obsolescence involved. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on to ghost assets. Um, did you, was there a physical inventory taken for each location? There was not. Okay. This was a, a physical inventory has been a, a large issue in the Grocery Star uh, uh, field for a very long time. I believe that uh, some of the letters and articles that we detailed did go over that fact. Uh, it's very difficult to perform that kind of study uh, regularly. Uh, like I said, I've performed that once for a different client, uh, and I've known one other person to have performed that in the past as well. Okay. Um, yeah. So there are disposals reported each year on the 571. Mm -hmm. So, so you're claiming there's more disposals than that, actually? I am. So where, where do those numbers come from? What numbers? The disposals that are reported. Uh, oh, where do they, uh, so why do they report some disposals but not all of them? Yeah. The people that are maintaining the books might be able to make some changes. Like they might know that some things come out of the store, but overall, historically, it's been very difficult for them to record those changes for small assets with small costs that fill up an entire store over the course of X many stores. It's been very difficult over the years. Additionally, so, if you look on um, the fixed asset detail, there's some costs that are all lumped together. It might just be fixtures, and it's two hundred thousand dollars. So when some of those fixtures are disposed, it's hard to keep track because it's one line item. But essentially, it might be thirty line items. So to be able to keep track of that is tough when you have one large line item like that. Where on the five seventy one L, they might have one POS system that they can directly relate back and go, oh, we disposed of that POS system. Let's take that off our fixed asset detail, and then we'll report it on the 571L as disposed. Okay. And then I have, I have one more, one last question about your auctions. You included uh, the valuation from those counties that the stores was were based in, um, in each of those attachments, uh, the tax bill, which had yes. the valuation on it. Yes. Uh, do you have a listing of what was in the auction compared to if everything was in the auction was was at the store on the valuation date for those bills or um, I cannot uh, testify to that directly, 
but in my experience and from also what we testified to adjacently, um, I wouldn't say that it's likely that all of the assets in the store were sold in that auction. Okay. And the reason why that that wouldn't be the case is because a lot of the equipment, as I mentioned from Jerry Evans's letter, a lot of the equipment is scrap uh, like from the sale date, like immediately. And so they don't take all of those assets. So uh, there was the other person that mentioned that they have smaller grocery stores and they purchased $800,000 of brand new equipment for $25,000, right? Well, it would have been $800,000 brand new. Um, but but when a whole store sells, it's not necessarily every asset inside that sells with it. And the problem is too, it's like kind of goes back to what we've been saying. They've have they have a lot of difficulty with disposals. It was being appraised at seven hundred and fifty, or it was being assessed at seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It got sold for twenty four thousand dollars. So it like it's likely that that issue where there was more stuff than there was actually there or actually had any value, it's probably likely. Okay, but there's no record of showing that. No. The, okay. Yeah. I think that's all I have. So you did, uh, since you were just talking about auction sales, mm -hmm. no, I think that's all. did you make any adjustments to those sales? Uh, I believe that an 18% adjustment was made upwards to ma to account for an internet uh, sale. Uh, we are using those auctions as a demonstration. Uh, we're showing you what the residual value of a store is. If we were to be presenting those as uh, one of the key points for our valuation, we would have gone into a little bit more depth about that and also uh, uh, presented a different uh, replacement cost new calculation. Uh, we did not use that today. Instead, we used it as a demonstration of the residual value that you could likely see in a, a handful of uh, stores that we have uh, information for. So you didn't actually do a sales comparison approach? No. Okay. So you're just using those, as you say, for a demonstration mm -hmm. of the residual value under auction sale or liquidation sale yes. conditions? That's correct. Okay. So regarding the refrigeration, uh, did you analyze the operating ex expenses of each of the existing refrigeration equipment under appeal? I did not. Did you ever provide any documentation to the assessor regarding? Um, I'm unaware if, uh, I believe that Brent Buzzkirk was the point of contact for this. I'm unaware if he uh, sent any more detailed refrigeration information. Okay. <clears throat> Did you ever provide evidence to the assessor such as remodeling cost, which would suggest the equipment is replaced often? Um, I'm unsure if uh, Brent might have supplied that information. Um, Provided remodeling costs, though, like uh, in, uh, you know, most of the time when we would go and demonstrate that, we would uh, actually turn to the assessor's trend tables, and uh, you're able to see from the trend tables most of the time uh, where those remodels kind of happened, especially with the stack costs. Like if we went and looked through a few of these, it might have been in there. Brent might have gone through that. Uh, with your office, but I'm unsure if he has. Um, but that is a common way that we would often look at that, and we'd often see that. Um, obviously, when we talk to Vons about it, like they can go and tell us, like, as we saw in their letter, that they go and remodel every five to eight years. Um, as for detail for the cost and whether they, they record it or track it as a remodel cost, I'm not sure. Um, in my experience, I haven't seen that before where it's separately laid out like that and detailed as a remodel cost, but um, yeah, to answer your question, uh, no, I don't believe that we have a detail of the remodel costs okay. specifically laid out. So have you ever used Vons' fixed asset list uh, to come up with your own lifing study? Uh, no, and there's many problems with that. Um, 
using Vons' own asset list for the lifing study would be extremely difficult due to the problems uh, with their uh, disposals. When you go and take a look, uh, if you perform a, a weighted average age calculation for some of these stores, um, you might see that the weighted average age is uh, significantly higher than if you visited the store, you would see uh, what, uh, how old that equipment actually is. Um, yeah. So you do agree that it, your, your client does file 571L business property statements annually, correct? They do file annually. And they do list disposals, or they do report disposals, I should say. They report some disposals, but... Uh, it's like your contention that it's insufficient. Oh, that's correct. Is that correct? Yeah. And those statements are signed under penalty of perjury. Is that correct? Do you agree? The yes. uh, 571Ls are submitted under... Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so your, your contention is that they are misreporting assets and yet still filing under pen penalty of perjury, that that is the correct asset listing for that year. Well, and the county also audits our client for mistakes like that, underreporting, stuff like that. That's why the county has an entire audit division, because mistakes are made. That completes our questions. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Does the board have any questions of the applicant's presentation? I do. <clears throat> on exhibit 14, on page two, I'm comparing that to exhibit six, which was ostensibly the same page from 2019 and 2020. I see in 2019 there are extra rows that don't appear in the 2020 valuation. Um, they're small items. I'm just wondering, is this taken from the uh, assessor, or could you explain why there are differences here in the number of rows? Yeah, uh, so uh, year over year, uh, when we file the 571L, we might report costs uh, into certain categories, or uh, the assessor might put the costs into certain categories without seeing the 571L. I would be uncertain. Uh, but uh, if you look at 2019, they have a variety of uh, different categories that they've placed their equipment in. And then in 2020, it seems like those have been consolidated a bit. Uh, typically, when I see this, uh, this can just be a difference of whoever uh, uh, filled in the 571 LS that year, whoever uh, recorded it from the county and, and, and trended it that year. It's uh, a simple difference between those things. Uh, typically with a grocery store, like you'll see these uh, small uh, categories like shopping carts, electronic E2, POS equipment. Uh, POS equipment is typically uh, always broken out. Uh, PCs are typically broken out, but things like shopping carts and electronic EQ and uh, in 2019, you can see these uh, office and other equipments. Uh, sometimes those categories might get lumped into each other, especially if they have uh, a similar life. Um, the difference should not uh, be a terribly huge difference in the reported cost year over year, unless, of course, there was a, an uptick in the most recent year, uh, wherein they might have had a uh, large or small remodel or refresh. Um, 
but yeah, so the, the differences in the categories, like I'm, I, I can't say for certain if it's uh, a difference between the reporting or, or the recording. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the board? Okay, I think we are set with our questions of your presentation right now. I think now it's time for the assessor's office to present their side. All right, the assessor's exhibits have been submitted. We will label them just as they have on their table of contents, exhibits A through S. Thank you. We're ready? Whenever you are, yep. Okay, let's start on, we already went over the overview on page three of exhibit A, so let's start on page four. Uh, just a little bit of background. We are, as we know, uh, discussing the personal property and fixtures for Vaughn's and Albertson's for 2019 and 2020 lien date. Um, an audit was completed in 2021, which covered both of those lien dates, um, where the accuracy of the property statements was confirmed. Uh, the fixed asset lists were obtained along with invoices, uh, the general ledgers, et cetera. And the audit did verify that all of the costs on the asset lists were being reported uh, with full economic costs involved, which includes labor materials, freight, shipping, insulation, and sales tax. Uh, page six, there was a uh, CITUS inspection on 523 and 524 of 2023 of those six locations listed in the middle of page six. Uh, the equipment observed was uh, generally in good condition, and managers stated that they don't remodel but simply refresh, and there was nothing to substantiate that the equipment is frequently replaced. And moving on to page seven, as I mentioned, the audit was clear. Um, everything was being reported as it shows on the asset lists. Uh, going into the approaches of value, um, neither the applicant or the assessor used the income approach. Um, the comparative sales approach was not used by the applicant, but, or at least in the current presentation, they, in uh, information they provided us previously, this was considered. Um, I, we'll just point out that the reason why the assessor does not think the, the auction sales are appropriate to use as a comparable. Um, per r and code 110 and tax rule two, they don't meet the uh, conditions for an open market transaction, which includes both parties seeking to maximize their gains and neither party taking advantage of the exigencies of others. So basically these are forced liquidations. I, Clo uh, sales of stores that have closed where the, um, the seller is essentially trying to get rid of their cut costs as soon as possible. And buyers are aware of that and they, they go to these auctions to get good deals. Uh, page 10 it discusses some, uh, at the bottom of the page 10, some general comments about comparative sales. Uh, the comparative sales approach is limited in its application to personal property and business fixtures. And 
sales comparables would usually not be good indicators of value for other types of property that require extensive testing or considerable installation costs, which Vaughn's equipment does. So moving on to page 11, the cost approach. This was their um, primary method of valuation. Uh, they started their basis with the Marshall and Swift valuation of 31 to 51 50 per square foot, and then they made adjustment, adjustments for um, location and time. If you look at the quote there in the middle of page 11, this is from Marshall and Swift. The quoted price ranges are of necess necessity very rough. For more accuracy, purchase prices, subcontractors' costs, installers' costs, or manufacturers' prices should be obtained where possible by make and model. So Marshall and Swift itself says, if you have the actual data, you should use it. It doesn't say adjust that data down to this, this price range. Moving on to page 12, the life that they selected, the nine-year life, comes from an IRS publication used for accounting purposes, uh, basically uh, depreciation expense for book value. It, it's not meant to be used for market value. And then page 12 through 12 and 13 um, aren't applicable here because they did not use an effective age. This was this presentation was based on information they provided us, you know, several months ago. Uh, we were just notified in the past week that they wouldn't be presenting this. Um, they used the actual ages of the equipment on their cost approach. The difference is the adjustment they made to those was based on uh, the actual reproduction cost compared to the Marshall and Swift reproduction cost. They took that ratio and applied it to the historical costs, which it's not uh, anywhere in Marshall and Swift to use that valuation method, and it's, that's not a known, any known method that the assessor is aware of for, for the cost approach. Starting on page 14, des describes the, uh, the cost approach the assessor uses, which conforms to property, rules, property tax rule six. Um, you start with the historical ac acquisition costs, uh, apply an index factor, and then per, uh, apply a percent good factor to account for depreciation. Uh, middle of page 15, there's a quote there. Uh, if a cost approach is employed, the cost shall include the full economic cost of placing the property in service, uh, including typically incurred in bringing the property to a finished state, including labor and materials, freight or shipping costs, installation costs, sales or use taxes, and additions for market uh, and entrepreneurial services. So uh, after you get the uh, historical costs, then you apply an index factor um, where the original cost is adjusted in the aggregate in the aggregate or by groups for price level changes since original construction by multiplying the cost incurred uh, in a given year by an appropriate index price factor. And those, uh, those index factors are published in the Assessor's Handbook 581 annually. Uh, page 16, it also discusses that, you know, functional obsolescence is considered in those index factors. Um, there's a a maximum index that's used, which is equal to 125% of the service life. So for store equipment, uh, you wouldn't index past 15 years, which is 125% uh, of 12. And then page 17, this is just a, a table of the index factors for 2019 and just an example of how they're applied to the original costs. These aren't any actual original costs. This is just this is just an example of index factors being applied. And then after the cost is indexed, a percent good factor is applied 
uh, to account for depreciation. In the page 18 at the top there, it says, uh, the cost estimated shall be reduced by the amount that such cost is estimated to exceed the current value of the reproducible property by reason of physical deterioration, misplacement, over, under improvement, and other forms of depreciation or obsolescence. The percentage that the remainder represents of the reproduction or replacement cost is the property's percent good. And those are also uh, published annually in AH 581. So moving on at the bottom of page 18 and on to 19, it discusses the Iowa curves and percent good factors. So this, this is just, this talks about how the CAA uh, determines, determines the lives that they come up with. Uh, they do uh, these mortality studies, which basically use the um, actual, actual cost data, uh, and apply statistical methods to the data, and you get the survivor curves. And then there's a whole list of survivor curves and you can match them to the appropriate uh, service life. And then after that life is selected, uh, percent good tables are, are made for each life. And uh, middle of page 19 is, is just the, uh, the calculation of percent good. It's based on uh, the time value of money tables. And then at the top of page 20, there's a quote there. We can say that the factors include a normal amount of physical deterioration, normal functional obsolescence, and to the extent that is normal, normal economic obsolescence. And the applicant has not provided any documentation showing there is any abnormal obsolescence. Uh, additionally, there was a life study done uh, recently it's, we have an exhibit on it later, but it was done by the CAA uh, using Vaughn's actual historical cost data, including refrigeration, um, and it still is recommending a 12-year life. This is what we're looking at on page 21. Page 21? Um, yeah, I'm a little lost where we oh, are. Oh, on page 20 right now, but I'm just about to get to page 21. Um, okay. I didn't mean to jump ahead. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, I'm going to page 21 now. Well, I was right here. I, I mentioned the, a lifing study was just completed by the CA. Okay, moving on to page 21. These are this is just examples of the uh, percent good factors. At the at the top of that table is every uh, different service lives. So we would we would select 12, and then and then the historical costs would be uh, multiplied by that uh, percent good factor, or the indexed cost. And then at the bottom of 21 there is just a, an example of that, uh, and his historical cost being multiplied by an index factor, and then that index cost is uh, multiplied by the percent good factor. Uh, page 22 is just, top of page 22, we just have a list of uh, different equipment uh, with the different lives the CA recommends for each of those types of equipment. Okay, at the bottom of page 22, um, the ASA does recommend a, a step for um, calculating extra functional obsolescence. Uh, one to uh, steps one through seven uh, outline that procedure. Um, the applicant has not done that. Uh, additionally, LTA 201030 outlines several methods for quantifying uh, extra obsolescence, which the applicant also has not provided. And then uh, the bottom of page 23, this is just uh, reiterating that there's, there's been a life study recently by the CA recommending a 12-year life um, based on Vaughn's historical cost data. And page 24, this is 
the combined index and percent good factors, and this is just showing that after 10 years, um, we value the equipment at approximately 35%. So we depreciate it 65% in total. And then page 25 here is our, after applying that cost approach, we have come up with these values. Um, the only difference from these, uh, from the original valuations is we looked over the costs and recategorized uh, some equipment, I think mostly TV equipment, we put into a shorter life table. And it resulted in, it resulted in some decreases. The, the red numbers on the right are the decreases at e each location based on those reclassifications. Uh, moving on to tab B. These are just the photos from the site checks. Nothing really to note here. Uh, the equipment is in good condition. And there's some pages for each store that was, that was visited. Uh, moving on to tab C, these are the valuations for each location using the cost approach. and the asset list, list that was used for those valuations. So it's about 500 pages of assets there. Okay, moving on to D. These are the original 571Ls um, and original valuations. And you can see disposals are included in, in each year's reporting. For those of us who are not, haven't looked at one of these in at least a long time, could you point out where the disposals are listed? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's, a, there's a separate 571 for every location. So let's go to page 20. This is for location 2430. Has a list of disposals there. And each location will have a list similar, similar to that. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to E. This is the lifing study that the CA completed in the summer of 2022. And it was based on Vons' asset lists. Um, Vons, Albertsons, and Safeway. And it included, it included all equipment, um, including refrigeration and it and it found that a 12-year life was still appropriate. So. If I could add, um, I just want to point out on page four of exhibit E, uh, down in the second to last paragraph towards the bottom, I just want to make sure it's also very clear to the board that the life study that was performed um, by the CAA it inherently includes all forms of depreciation, including physical, functional, and economic. You'll see there in the second to last sentence. And so that all of that is wrapped up into this study. It, it does include those forms of obsolescence. Uh, so I, I just wanted to make sure the board uh, saw that. Thank you. So then, Mr. Vernon, I have a question. Yes. Uh, you said that could you point out to me in, I'm sure it's on page one or two somewhere, that this is including the refrigeration equipment in this lifing survey? Um, let's see where it's here. 
Yeah, there it is. Uh, on page four, the second to last paragraph in the middle, um, only data related to the bulk of the grocery store equipment, display cases, refrigeration, and fixtures was included in the study. Thank you. And then page five through 24 of this exhibit um, explains the steps in the lifing study. This is, and this is from the uh, Assessor's Handbook 504. It's a lot of statistics and math, basically. Okay, moving on to uh, F. F is just the, uh, all of the 441D requests that, that um, we sent to the applicant. Various dates, uh, various requests were made for different uh, pieces of information. Uh, tab or tab G, exhibit G. Uh, these are the invoices. Um, and there wasn't any, there weren't any discrepancies found in the invoices. They match the, they match the costs on the asset list and include all, all required economic costs. Tab H. Mr. Vernon, could yes. you tell us again what is what are we looking at in Tab G? What is this? Tab G is the invoices. Uh, the, these were obtained in the audit. Um, they're just included. They're included for information. There weren't there weren't any discrepancies found. All all of the costs that need to be included in the reported costs are, which was verified by the invoices. And then Tab H is the CA position paper. This um, for 2019 and 2020. This gives the index factors, uh, percent goods, recommended lives, uh, everything that's used in the uh, cost approach. Nothing more to point out there. Uh, exhibit I is the percent good factors from the uh, Assessor's Handbook 582. Again, this is just the, uh, how these are calculated based on the, the time value of money. Um, the idea that uh, the value of property is equal to the present worth of its future net income. Uh, page seven talks more about the mortality studies that are used in the in the CA lifing studies. And then page 27 there, uh, since percent good factors are not computed according to causes of depreciation, it is impossible to quantify the portion of the indicated value loss that is due to various causes. However, we can say that the, very fac that the factors include a normal amount of physical deterioration, normal functional obsolescence, and to the extent that is normal, normal economic obsolescence. Tab J. Or just some excerpts from the assessor's handbooks. Let's see if I can point out any anything important here. Uh, page seven, rule four, an opinion of value within a range of values or an opinion of value based on an overall adjustment is not in accord with rule four.
Moving on to exhibit K, some excerpts from the AH 504. We talked about all this. Yeah, we talked about all that. And exhibit L is the various code sections that are applicable. Um, Rule six um, is the most important one since that is the uh, comparable sales approach. Or I'm sorry, the uh, cost approach. Um, what page is that, 33? On page 33, the original cost of reproducible properties shall be adjusted in the aggregate or by groups for price level changes since original construction. Um, that's the index, that's indexing the original cost. and then you uh, apply a percent good factor. So we talked about that too. Um, moving on to exhibit M. This is the LTA for measuring extra obsolescence. Um, the applicant included this in their presentation, but I just wanna point out on page 9 lists methods for quantifying um, any extra obsolescence market method uh, equipment index factor and percent good factor method sampling method straight line or age life method and breakdown method uh, and the applicant did not provide any of those any of those calculations I'm sorry that that was on page 12 the methods for calculating extra obsolescence And then the rest of that LTA just goes on to explain how those methods are. It gives examples of, of those methods. Um, exhibit N is from the ASA. I mean, most of this was talking about effective age, which they didn't use. This was based on on the information that they gave us prior to today's presentation. So we don't, we can skip that exhibit altogether. So O has the Marshall and Swift uh, guides and the IRS publications. So on page eight of this uh, exhibit, at the top there, it says, uh, most of the useful lives for depreciable assets other than buildings are extracted from US Treasury Department, IRS publication 946. Um, and for more complete description, see IRS publication 534. Uh, basically, those are, those are guides for calculating uh, depreciation expense for accounting methods or accounting records and are not s meant to be used for market value. I'm sorry, could you please repeat uh, the page and, and exhibit number? Uh, page eight of exhibit O at the top, it's, it just highlights where those lives are coming from. Starting on page 19 of that exhibit are the IRS publications, and there's nothing in them about market value. Uh, moving 
on to exhibit P. On page three there, this is just a uh, case, um, uh, Fujitsu Microelectronics versus uh, the Assessment Appeals Board. What county was that? That was San Diego County. Um, if a taxpayer fails to present evidence sufficient to overcome the presumption that the assessor has properly performed his or her duties and assessed all properties fairly, then the burden of proof does not shift to the assessor and he or she may stand on the presumption that the assessment was fair and equitable. Uh, tab Q. This is another case. Uh, this is just saying that, you know, it's uh, the applicant's responsibility to provide documentation to support any value change. And then exhibit S, this is just uh, some refrigeration studies. But again, there aren't, they didn't, pro they provided these refrigeration studies, but they didn't provide any, anything to quantify uh, how much the obsolescence should be, if any. And that's the last exhibit. Uh, we have this rebuttal exhibit. Do we pass these out now? Just to confirm with the assessor, there was a blank on R. There's no exhibit R in the binder. That's the rebuttal exhibit. We're passing that out now. Documents for Exhibit R, which was previously assigned an exhibit number, have been submitted, and then a new exhibit, which we'll call Exhibit T, um, with the heading from the California State Board of Equalization, will be added as Exhibit T. Okay, so this is the re rebuttal um, to the applicant's presentation. There's nothing, there's not too much more information that, that we already didn't discuss. I'll, I will try to highlight anything that we didn't go over already. Um, page two talks about auction sales. We already discussed that those don't qualify for open market transactions. Um, and page three just lists a, a various types of auctions. Page four talks about trade level adjustment. Um, so basically, I mean, they didn't make, they didn't make a evaluation on auctions, so so there weren't any adjustments made, but if there were, you would you would need to make adjustments for an installation freight uh, location, and a trade level adjustment would you know an auction would be considered a wholesaler, and and then the end user, which bonds is, would be considered a consumer. So you would need to make some sort of adjustment for that. And then on page seven. The auctions aren't comparable uh, pursuant to RNT code 402.5. Primarily for location. Um, this list of auctions here is what they provided us previously. They didn't present any, any of that today. So so the ones they presented today would, would not be Apple primarily due to location. And then on page 18, no adjustments were made to those auctions pursuant to tax rule four for installation, freight, location, et cetera. Uh, 
on page nine talks about reverse trending, which is a method, a method to account for uh, old costs that should be no longer there when, when something new replaces it. Um, but again, the applicant provided no documentation that, that their disposals aren't accurate or that any, any other disposal should be made. And then again, nine and 10 talk about uh, refrigeration obsolescence. Uh, again, they, the applicant provided no evidence um, or quantification of, of obsolescence. And then at the bottom of page 10 there, it talks more about life cycles and uh, evaluation studies. Again, there was a very recent uh, study by the CA using Vaughn's equipment finding a 12 year life. And then page 12, again, um, the Marshall and Swift's square footage costs. There's a little uh, highlight in the middle there. Uh, the quoted price range are very rough. For more accuracy, purchase prices, uh, subcontractors' costs, installers' costs, uh, or manufacturers' prices should be obtained. And it doesn't say that those uh, costs should be obtained and then adjusted downward. Uh, they did not do the weighted effective age in this valuation. And then page 13 talks about the life, uh, the lives from Marshall and Swift. Again, they're from the IRS, not done from any uh, composite study. And 14 and 15 are still talking about that. And then finally on 16 is the summary, or the last sentence. Uh, from May department stores versus County of Los Angeles. Los Angeles, the assessor need not accept evaluation formula. It has no way of verifying. Um, yeah, so basically the, the only information we have is their costs original costs and the only appropriate uh, method of valuation with those costs is the cost approach per property tax rule six. That's the end. That concludes the presentation. Thank you very much. Does the applicant have any questions of the assessor's presentation? So the assessor had uh, talked about um, assessor's handbook 581 having normal functional and normal economic depreciation. So if we had three companies and they were all in three different industries and one had normal obsolescence, the other had extreme obsolescence, and the last one had zero obsolescence, you're saying the trended table would calculate that all? No, the, the trended tables count for normal obsolescence. Any, any extra obsolescence uh, needs to be quantified. So a company with no obsolescence would get an obsolescence adjustment if there's normal? If they documented it to us, yes. Through just the trended, uh, trended um, tables only? No. No, if they, if they had extra obsolescence and they documented it to us, then it, it would be adjusted. The tables account for normal obsolescence. Anything extra is not in the tables. So it's my understanding too, the assessor's office is saying that the applicant didn't use the right approach um, when valuing this equipment. The Marshall and Swift approach you used? Yes. Yeah, it we're, doesn't. It we're doesn't. happy to answer questions about our presentation at this point. That was in your presentation. Yeah, I, I, I can answer that. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, there's no valuation approach that, that we're aware of that uses the method that, that, that you used. Would you agree that rule six for the property tax rules 
um, is accurate for property taxation purposes? In other words, would you agree with this statement? In Rule 6, um, Section B, it says the reproduction cost of a reproductible property may be estimated either by one, adjusting the property's original cost for price level changes and the abnormalities, if any, or two, applying current prices to the property's labor and material components with appropriate additions for entrepreneur services, interest on borrowed or owner supplied, owner supplied funds and other costs typically incurred in bringing the property to a finished state or to a lesser state if unfinished on the lien date. Estimates made under two above may be made using square foot, cubic foot, or other unit costs, a summation of the in-place cost of all components, a quantity survey of all material, labor, and other cost elements, or a combination of these methods. Would you agree with that? Yes, but it doesn't say that, that the square foot should be adjusted based on, on the actual historical costs. Okay. <clears throat> then would, you, would the assessor's office agree that the difference between replacement cost and reproduction cost is functional obsolescence? No. Okay, those if, we, are can, two interchangeable if terms. we can go into applicant's exhibit two so that I can show, and then on page 47, we have a very similar example of exactly our case. Do you mean our exhibit B? Applicant's exhibit two. Excuse me, what page? 47. Oh, there, there. Your, your exhibit. So it says replacement property, widget, production equipment, model B. At the bottom it says the 484 represents the cost of a new modern replacement asset of the same capacity of the subject. Subtracting the 484,000 from the trended acquisition, which is the reproduction cost, represents functional obsolescence from excess capital costs. So would you say that's inaccurate? That, that would be a method for calculating excess functional obsolescence. So it would calculate functional obsolescence, excess capital costs. Yes, but the, uh, yeah. Okay. Perhaps we could uh, focus on the assessor's presentation. Um, in the assessor's presentation, we did present information related to an LTA that outlines the methods for calculating the obsolescence. Perhaps it's the same, but we, we don't have your presentation in front of us at the moment. I agree, but it was mentioned in your guys' um, case, these same issues. If they weren't mentioned, yeah, we couldn't bring it up. Direct us where in our presentation you're referring to? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, I, I was just, I, I have two questions and I was just trying to find the first one again. While he's looking, Ms. Sill, you mentioned LPA and it's been a while since I've been advising the Assessment Appeals Board, so I need all the help I can get with the acronyms. <laughs> My apologies, that stands for letter to assessor. Oh, okay. okay. And what I was referring to was exhibit M, which is, uh, Guidelines for substantiating additional obsolescence for personal property and fixtures. And so within this LTA, it does outline some methodologies um, that could be used to calculate uh, additional obsolescence. Thank you. It's probably worth noting that um, 
I, I don't believe the applicant used any of these methods to calculate their obsolescence. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just go ahead and I'll just uh, skip basically to my last question here. Um, so on this exhibit E, this lifing study that was performed, uh, are you guys familiar uh, with, or did you did you perform this study? Uh, the CAA did. So uh, you guys did not have a hand in performing the study. No. Typically, a, a smaller subcommittee of the CAA, it's not reasonable to have all 58 counties participate in a study. It's just too many cooks in the kitchen. No, so a, a subcommittee would be selected. And so you can see the counties that participated um, in, in developing the study. I'm seeing Placer, Los Angeles, Santa Clara, and San Mateo. So you guys would not be able to testify to uh, the uh, the assets that were used in the lifing study or the data or where it came from? That information is held confidential typically. Um, none of us were obviously in any of the counties that participated. Um, you can see a summary up front where they did uh, look at over $1.8 billion of assets um, from the fixed asset listings of Safeway, Vons, and Albertsons. So it was a review of the fixed asset listings of several companies? Just Vons, not several. What's that? The assets were only from Vons, not several different companies. Okay, so it's, it was just Vons. Okay. Albertsons, which is Vons. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this was a study performed with the fixed asset detail of Vons and Albertsons. And, and it was exclusively performed with the fixed asset detail, or was there any effort made to confirm the existence of the assets that were used in the lifing study? The summary of their findings and recommendations can be found on page four, and that outlines what they did. So just just from reading this over really quick, I'm not seeing I'm seeing that they manipulated the information somehow from uh, only data related to the bulk of the grocery store equipment and fixtures was included in the study. So I'm, I'm would you be able to testify to the the idea that they reviewed the equipment that was present? in the books that they were looking at? Or uh, would you guys say that you don't have a hand in that? So again, um, none of the three representatives from the assessor's office participated in the study. Uh, it's pretty clear that it covered the bulk of the assets. OK. OK, so yeah, that's, those, those are all my questions then. Okay, thank you. Does the board have any questions of the uh, of the assessor's office presentation? I do. Go ahead. Mr. Vernon, um, on Exhibit A, I think it starts on page 6, there's talk here of an audit that was done and that I believe you testified that there were no escape assessments found. Was there, uh, but there were situs inspections done maybe a little bit late due to COVID, but they were done. Did you find anything, I forget the proper word, it's not an escape, it would be 
over assessed. Yeah, that's not the right word, excuse me, for not having the term of art. But the applicant has testified that not all disposals may have been done. Did you find anything? No. Did you find no, anything missing? This no, story? typically we, we wouldn't compare, we wouldn't match every single asset on the asset list. To okay, so you can't speak to that. No. You can all, you know, okay, yeah. thank you. If I could add to that, it's also important to note ni neither party did a physical inventory of the store. The assessor has based uh, the valuation on the reported costs, which include disposals. And so that information was provided to us under penalty of perjury. It was confirmed in the audit. And so the costs reported to us are assumed to reflect what's in the store. There's been no evidence from the applicant to, to demonstrate what assets you know, they think weren't there. Um, they, it's simply their feeling, if you will. I mean, how do you have evidence of something you, I you don't know about? It's like the thing where you've seen where Amazon, it's like, oh, send us a picture of what you didn't receive. Like, how, how would anyone have evidence of that? Well, th that, that's a good question. And I think uh, this kind of falls, it, it comes down to the assessor is using the best available information that the assessor has in his possession. And right now, that is a fixed asset. Or it, it is the fixed asset list, and it is the 571Ls, uh, which were signed under penalty of perjury. If the applicant wanted to demonstrate that the physical inventory was something different than what was on the fixed asset list, it would be the burden of the applicant to demonstrate that. And that could be accomplished by, uh, for example, a physical inspection, which the applicant decided not to perform for whatever reason. So just going on a feeling is, we no, we can't do that. We have to base it on evidence. And the best evidence we have right now is is that 571L and the audited cost, the fixed asset list. So that's where we're at. Okay, any other questions from the uh, assessor's presentation? No. Chair Sisk, I just want to clarify um, to the assessor, exhibit A, last page at the bottom, it says page 25 of 26, but there is no page 26. So I just want to make sure the board isn't missing a page? No, 26 was blank. OK. And then just to confirm, you are recommending the board order a reduction in this case. Is that correct? Correct. OK. And because I'm the one who has to process their decision, exhibit A, page 25, the total value is what you're recommending the board reduce to, and the original value is what it was originally on appeal. Is that correct? Correct. OK, thank you for clarifying. Okay, if there's no further questions from the board, I believe it's time for the assessor's office to make their closing arguments. Well, I, I know that um, there was guidance provided prior to the hearing that typically the board will consider uh, the cost approach for, for this type of property. Auction sales, liquidation sales were brought up, so I just want to address it briefly um, just to make sure that we don't confuse the issue between sales and a cost approach. Um, the, as the, the assessor stated in our presentation, um, the assessor's opinion is that those auctions auction and liquidation sales don't represent fair market value. Uh, there was an LTA on that point presented um, with the assessor's evidence. They don't meet the requirements of property tax rule two and one and RNT code section 110. Um, they are for sales. Um, they don't allow parties to maximize their gains. They don't, um, and it allows the buyer to take advantage of the other party because they're it's basically a distressed sale. Um, so those aren't fair market value. So I know that those have been presented as evidence 
Uh, neither side, though, has done a sales comparison approach. So I think it's important to keep that in mind because while they sold for very low prices, it's not representative of fair market value. So we don't want that number to influence the fair market value conclusion in this case. Uh, the real issues that I think are uh, at hand in this case is we're talking about what should the, the cost new be. Uh, we're talking about whether or not disposals have been accounted for appropriately. Um, we're talking about the life that should be used and what's the most applicable life, um, and then whether or not there should be some obsolescence adjustment. Uh, and so just to, to recap, and I'll, I'll try to make it brief, but uh, there was a lot of information presented, so uh, I'll, I'll do the best I can here. Um, as far as the cost new, uh, like the assessor mentioned, we did use the audited costs. Uh, it's based on their own books and records. They do report disposals to us and uh, they do report those under penalty of perjury. So when it comes to what cost should we use, we should use the best available information. Um, and and I, it seems clear that those two factors, their, their fixed asset list and their 571L signed under penalty of perjury, that's the best available information that we have when it comes to cost new. What the applicant did, however, is they took the cost new, they indexed it, and then they made some other adjustment to uh, account for there being some theoretical maximum uh, number that, that that should be. Keep in mind that that was based on a very limited selection of stores. Uh, there were interesting adjustments made to that. Um, not all of those stores were outfitted. If you look at it, some of them had costs dating back to 1999. So it seems like they were pulling equipment, used equipment from other stores or from their warehouse. So those 10 stores that they said were the cost new were not actually the cost new. Uh, when we get to disposals, um, I, I think I've, well, maybe I've mentioned that enough, but you know, they they report them, um, so so we we take what they report and and we run with it um, until we have evidence to the contrary, which in this case we don't have. Uh, the other uh, issue at hand here is is the life uh, that's being used. The applicant is suggesting that we should base it off Marshall and Swift. Um, if you look at the Marshall and Swift. Uh, Document, though, it's very clear that that life, that nine-year life that they pulled from there was based on an IRS publication that has nothing to do with actual valuation of property. Um, so what the assessor did is we based it on the actual uh, economic life that's experienced by actual Vaughn's assets, and that's reflected in the CAA study in the CAA lifing study that was done on Vons's own equipment that showed a 12-year life was not just appropriate, but what they actually experienced for their own assets. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have obsolescence. Um, the assessor didn't make an additional adjustment for obsolescence. Um, it, it wasn't appropriate, it's captured in the index, it's captured in the uh, depreciation factors in the lives that we use. That's um, that was in both the the manual and then also in the CEA study. It was very clear that it includes typical obsolescence. So all of those disposals of you know apparent disposals of refrigeration equipment that are apparently excessive. That's all take. That's all captured because they studied including up to and including that refrigeration equipment. Uh, I, the, the applicant did spend some time talking about federal regulations. They talked about some uh, you know, new technology, but again, that, that's all accounted for in, in, the, in that lifing study. That's all been taken into account. Um, there's been no evidence to suggest that 
Um, they're disposing of the older equipment at a higher rate. Um, there's no requirement to not use that older refrigerate, refrigeration equipment. Um, and then when they do dispose of it, they report it on the 571L and then the assessor doesn't assess it anymore. So uh, it, the assessor just, it, there's no evidence in the assessor's opinion to make any additional obsolescence adjustment. And so I think that, um, I think that summarizes the assessor's position. Uh, the assessor is recommending a slight reduction um, based on, I believe, reclassification of a few assets uh, to make sure that they're in the right category and, and that they're um, being assessed appropriately. Uh, so that, that concludes uh, the assessor's conclusion, unless either of these two gentlemen have anything to add. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, it is time for your closing arguments now. So uh, we've presented a lot of information today. Uh, I feel like we've uh, uh, spoken a lot about uh, the, the grocery, store mar grocery store market, uh, the market for grocery stores, and uh, what kind of uh, environment uh, this market takes place in. Uh, We've gone through a lot of information. Uh, we believe that uh, our opinion of value is the closest to the fair market value in exchange as of a given lien date. Uh, we've presented uh, several different arguments helping to substantiate that point. Uh, we have our replacement cost new numbers developed from Marshall and Swift. We were able to bolster that number uh, using 10 store openings that we had for Vons themselves. Uh, we were also able to demonstrate the extremely low value, the extremely low residual value that these assets have at the end of their lives uh, through the uh, auction sales that we had. Uh, we were able to, uh, as for the life, uh, for the nine-year life, we were able to show that the IRS publication recommends the nine-year life, I believe. Marshall and Swift recommends the uh, range from seven to 11 years. And we had a bunch of industry uh, letters all indicating that either they will refresh on an eight-year life, which uh, the assessor uh, testified that the manager said that they do not do, whereas our documentation from Vons indicated that that's their plan and that's what they do. Um, uh, we also uh, were able to substantiate uh, the nine-year life uh, with our industry articles, all indicating, uh, I believe, that uh, they go through refresh cycles and they want to maximize their, uh, their capital gains. Uh, this is a hearing that's based on the preponderance of the evidence. I feel like we have gone up, down, and backwards to uh, you know, solidify our position, uh, check for any blind spots, make sure that our evaluation is the closest to the fair market value that it can be. We've considered all the approaches we found appropriate approaches to use uh, both in the opening phase and the closing phase. So we have information from both cradle and grave, right? Um, the preponderance of the evidence, uh, uh, evidentiary standard is a 50-50. So if you think that we were even closer to right, 51% closer to right than the assessor's office, again, that's uh, towards us. Uh, we have our, our, our letters as well, and as well as the testimony that auctions are valid uh, in the sale of, of uh, grocery store equipment. Uh, since grocery store equipment sells in that environment, it is an appropriate uh, environment to uh, find the residual value of the equipment that's often very low. Uh, the grocery stores uh, have always had this issue, uh, the issue of disposals. It's something that we believe that our approach is, uh, is, is able to capture and highlight and uh, account for, uh, especially with our uh, adjustment to the replacement cost new. Uh, we're able to see uh, that a Vaughn store is able to open for about $65 a square foot, and we're able to see that over time as the store grow, grows older, its replacement cost new or reproduction cost new per square foot 
goes up with time as those costs are pyramided on top of each other. We feel that our adjustment to the year life and the adjustment to the uh, starting cost in the first place are both adequate to, uh, to capture the uh, inefficiencies of the, the historical cost approach. Do you want to add anything, Rick? The only thing I would add um, is, you know, we've kind of gone back and forth with the assessor about the IRS and Marshall and Swift, but I do want to add um, the CAA, when they developed their economic lives, what were the two publications that they used? The IRS 942 and Marshall and Swift. That was directly in our case in chief. So if the assessor wants to say that us using a nine-year life using that, but they can use it as a CAA, which the CAA adopted from those two publications, it makes no sense. So that's the only thing I would add. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the board will take all of the evidence and de debate behind closed doors. We will announce Brendan, our decision, probably later today, and then Brendan will inform you probably later in the week of our decision. Is there any other housekeeping issues, Brendan? There are no other items of business today. You can adjourn to closed session for your deliberations. All right, it's 2.02, and court is adjourned. Thank you very much.